Good morning. Good morning. It is February 22nd, 2024. It's day one, two of the state versus Hannah Gutierrez. She was the armorer on the set of Rust when Alec Baldwin fatally shot cinematographer Helena Hutchins. I am going to be covering this trial as much as we can, gavel to gavel. The court is not ready yet. This morning, the judge has changed out her chair. They have talked about what videos will be shown to witnesses this morning, which leads me to believe opening statements will be pretty brief so that they will um, be showing videos. Those will not be shown to court TV cameras. And right now we are waiting for court to start. So I'm going to do a quick road so far of this case, though I did that this week on the Emily Show podcast. Roll the intro. We're going to go to New Mexico. They're anticipating a three-week trial. Today, the reason I say it's day one is because yesterday all day was uh, jury selection. So it's not full day jury. It's not day one of what we can see, but it's day one of the trial. Today's day one for us. We're, we get to pick what we want to do because we're law nerds and that's what we do. So I'm going to roll the intro. We're going to get started. We're going to do a road so far and then we'll just chat while we're waiting for court to start because even when court tries to start on time, court often doesn't start on time. There's always something. So the judge walked off the bench about 10 minutes ago. They are waiting on something and uh, that's what we're going to do. So Let's roll, Law Nerds. Hey there, I'm Emily D. Baker, the internet's go-to legal analyst, breaking down the legal side of the pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. I'm a big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years, but this is not legal advice. This is where the Law Nerds unite to talk about facts, not <laughs> Let's get into it. So let's give a quick rundown while we are waiting for court to start. Hey, we've got a new seal. We've got a new seal to look at. It's We've been in South Carolina for a long time, like a long time. So we've got a new seal from the great state of New Mexico. So there we go. Something new to look at. <laughs> Delightful. Let's do a quick road so far. We are starting with the state versus Hannah Gutierrez, sometimes called Hannah Gutierrez Reed. Depending on the court filings you see, I wonder if she dropped the Reed, her stepfather's name, because Theo Reed is a very well-known armorer. He's on this witness list. We will see what happens. So in this case, the thing I am looking for the most is to find out how Live Rounds got onto this movie set. This criminal prosecution stems from the fatal shooting of Helena Hutchins, the cinematographer on the movie, by Alec Baldwin. Alec Baldwin's trial date has not been set yet. The court said that they are going to set the trial date on Monday, and that should be set for the summer, June, July. This trial will give us a lot of information about this case that we don't know and about what's going to happen when Alec Baldwin goes to trial in the summer. Because what Alec Baldwin's attorney said at the last court hearing was, let's go. Let's go now. So we will see that trial in the summer. They are charged with the same things, except Hannah Gutierrez is also charged with uh, evidence tampering due to some uh, alleged cocaine that was in her pocket on the movie set that day. Because after the shooting happened, she went from the movie set to the police car to the police station for an interview back to her hotel. And it is alleged by the prosecution that she then gave that to someone. So if they searched her room or whatever, it wouldn't be found. Um, so we will see what happens with that. That's what's being tried. Did they recover the cocaine and chemically test it? I don't know. Did she admit that that's what it was? I don't know. We have a lot of questions in this case. The state is alleging that Hannah Gutierrez is the one who brought live rounds onto the set. And in fact, that they have pictures of her holding live ammunition 12 days before this fatal shooting. We know from the OSHA report, and the OSHA report won't be evidence, but it'll be used by defense experts later in the trial, that this, this set was unsafe. There had been misfires on the guns earlier. Um, the camera crew walked off because of safety concerns. There was no video village, so they couldn't see what was going on in the church at the time. Hannah Gutierrez Reed was not in the church at the time of the fatal shooting. There's a lot that we don't know about this case. There was no preliminary hearing. Hannah Gutierrez waived preliminary hearing. 
We've seen some motions, but not a ton. And we've also seen some sealing orders. So what had happened earlier in trial is the defense was making a motion to dismiss because one of the key witnesses in this case had gotten a hold of the cell phone dump from Hannah Gutierrez's cell phone. The defense agreed for the cell phone of Hannah Gutierrez to be searched, not a search warrant. They agreed. It was a consent search of the cell phone. So the law enforcement dumped the cell phone. That got turned over to prosecution. Apparently, there are text messages there between her and her attorneys. The attorneys never said, hey, there's conversations in here. Uh, the judge said to the defense attorneys at the last court hearing that I covered, uh, that's on you. So uh, you should have done your job, and it's not on the prosecution. But one of the key witnesses in this case, Seth Kinney from PDQ Arm and Prop, did a public information records request and got all of those text messages. So the state let him know, hey, don't read the ones between her and her attorney. But uh, the defense is real pissed, real pissed that one of the key witnesses in this case, who was not charged, the person from the prop house was not charged in this case. One of the key witnesses in this case has those text messages. So I imagine Emily speculation noise. This is this is Emily educated speculation. I imagine that after that all came forward, others made public record requests because that is now sealed. There was a sealing order put in place yesterday uh, sometime during jury selection, that if anyone else makes a public records request, that the cell phone dump will not be turned over. I imagine that after it was disclosed that that's how these were obtained, that probably multiple outlets put in public records requests. And that's why the court is like, oh yeah, no, we're going to, we're going to go ahead and seal this. And the prosecution's like, we're going to go ahead and seal this. So that's um that's special and i i can see it right you can see it once people know once the public knows oh there's an entire cell phone dump okay <laughs> okay i want to read that too like i want to read that too so hopefully we will get some answers in this trial the judge what i anticipate this morning is when the jury comes in and i see a lot of you saying that it's being reported that a juror got stuck in traffic due to an accident on the way to court <sighs> the judge is going to be thrilled about that that um, they're going to hear the opening instructions, then they're going to hear opening statements, then we're going to get right into witnesses before lunch, and because they're starting late, the judge will probably push back lunch. I run everything on Central Time. Court is on Mountain Time, so it is just after 9 a.m. in the court, so it's 10-10 uh, it's here, so it's 9-10 there, which means this juror is almost 45 minutes late to court, which on the first day of court with this judge is not is not gonna is not gonna go is not gonna go well. So with all of it, um, Court TV said juror was in the accident. If the jurors in the car accident, if the jurors in the car accident, they would replace the juror with an alternate. Here's what they seated yesterday for the jury. Let's just give that uh, information real quick. However, Court TV and law and crime and others all said Ruby Frankie and Jody Hildebrandt were getting up to 60 years. So I'm kind of like, couldn't y'all just listen? Like, it doesn't take long to look at the law in the state. And the prosecutor in Utah has said multiple times there's a 30-year cap on second-degree felonies. And all of the media outlets ran with, they can get up to 60 years. The fuck they can. They can, they can statutorily, they cannot. Like, cannot. They cannot. So let me swoop again. Let me pull up my notes real quick. The jury was seated yesterday. They, they record time, record time that they sat this jury. It is rare that you get to seat a jury in a high profile case in a day. Props to you, New Mexico. They pulled in 70 people, which seems shockingly small. And um, they sat seven men, five women, four alternates, which is a decent amount of jurors for a three week trial. So. With all of that, I'm going to answer your questions. I'm going to thank all of the all of the the members who have gifted memberships. For those of you asking if Hannah Gutierrez is in court, uh, yes, she is. We can go back to earlier this morning um, when she came into court. So let's just go back in time. There's no audio of any of this, but we can go back to the very beginning of the stream and just 
um, play her coming into court so you guys can see that well. I'm answering questions and talking. But um, Hannah's in court looking, um, A, a little bit scared because how the fuck could you not be? But B, um, just sedate. I expect very sedate clothing, very professional clothing. Um, and that's that's what we would expect to see. She's dressed, I mean, she, Hannah Gutierrez, I don't know who's sitting next to her, if that's one of her attorneys or not, but Hannah Gutierrez looks dressed like a lot of the prosecutors that I know. Kind of a a nice t-shirt of some kind and a suit jacket, and and that that is what I expect. So I don't know if those are both her defense attorneys. The one in the blue tie is the only one I've seen on the court recordings we're seeing the prosecutor in court who we've seen on those court uh those reportings before so i i think this is a very scary trial for hannah gutierrez i asked um on the podcast and if you guys haven't watched this week's podcast it's like a 30 minute summary of this case and some of the ins and outs but i asked you on the podcast do you think hannah gutierrez should be charged in this case she's being charged for involuntary manslaughter but we've got to see if she brought the live rounds onto set, it changes my mind a little bit. But we also have evidence that Dave Halls, who took a plea deal fucking immediately as the first AD in charge of safety, that Dave Halls told her, you don't have time to do a safety check before she handed over the gun. So if her superiors are preventing her from doing her job, what do you do? And so, Will the jury be empathetic to that, that she's not negligent, that her superiors were the ones who were negligent and she did not, um, she was not given adequate time to do her job. She is, um, this was her second movie. She is in her twenties. Um, I am empathetic to the fact that sometimes, especially when we're newer in our career, when, especially in a career like Hollywood, where if, if you're, if you're the problem, you're never working again that that is a very difficult thing. But if she brought these bullets onto set, if she was messing around on set, we will see what happens here. Um, but she was newer in her career and the OSHA report puts a lot of the blame at Dave Hall's feet and the prosecutors let him plea out of this thing as early as fucking possible. Also, none of this would have happened. None of this would have happened if there weren't live rounds in the gun and none of this would have happened if Alec Baldwin hadn't pulled the trigger. So those are the questions I have. I'm going into this with an open mind. I do have some empathy for her. We will see. That empathy will change. If she brought the live rounds onto set and and wasn't checking them adequately, um, I will still have empathy, but there will be a need for accountability there that might be different. So I think she is presenting really well in court. We've seen some people present not so well in court. Daryl Brooks building a fucking box fort to hide from the court um, didn't work. So Kristen asked, did he pull the trigger or let go of the hammer? The evidence from the prosecution is that he had to have pulled the trigger. So that is what the prosecution has said. They're going to argue that. And we're going to see the defense argue that she was adhering to industry standards. Her supervisors are the ones who were the problem. So she wasn't reckless and the rest of it. So excuse me so if you want a breakdown of involuntary manslaughter that's in the podcast i will get to it if court does not begin pretty soon but let us um let us and i'm going to answer some questions so let's make court we're going to make court little while we're waiting i don't understand how alec baldwin is charged he's charged with involuntary manslaughter because he pointed the gun at a person and pulled the trigger so that even if it was lawful for him to have the gun on the movie set, the standard for involuntary manslaughter when you are doing something that is legally permissible, doing something lawful, which I realize can sound like awful if I don't enunciate, even if he's doing something lawful, did he do it in a reckless way? Oh, the judge is holding the phone up to them. I imagine that's the juror that's stuck. Um, so if you are doing something lawful, it has to be reckless. Is Alec Baldwin pointing a gun directly at someone close range in a small space and pulling the trigger reckless? And you will get you will get weapons experts all up and down Alec Baldwin's trial saying on a movie set this shouldn't have happened. So we will see. I'm going to get to all of your questions. Um, 
gosh, Emily, she is so young, heartbreaking. And that's where, that's where I'm torn on this. I absolutely believe people need to be held responsible. Absolutely believe people need to be held responsible. But I am real salty and I, I'll see if I overcome the saltiness, but I'm real salty that the first AD, Dave Halls, who took the weapon from her and is alleged to have said to her, you don't have time for a weapons check, give me the gun, and then told Baldwin it was safe without checking him in, it himself, got to plea for six months and a misdemeanor. I'm, I'm still salty about that, personally. It doesn't feel right to me. He was literally the one in charge of safety. He was her supervisor and it was his job. And he had been, um, he had been shirking that duty per the OSHA report. He was the huge problem on set and there have been misfires on set. Um, the props person was doing something with one of the guns and fired the gun by accident. So, there had been issues with the guns and Dave Halls did nothing to correct it. He was in the position to correct it. So do I think everyone in that chain should be held responsible? Yes. Do I think Dave Halls being held more responsible than the armorer is the just thing? Um, not at this moment. Maybe that'll change throughout the trial. I'm giving you a snapshot of where my brain's at today. Maybe that'll change. But um, I think the original prosecutor jumped at this to get to Alec Baldwin because his hand was on the gun. But I think that um, the youngest person on set with the least amount of uh, pull on this set is the one that's getting thrown under the bus first, and that doesn't always sit right. I would like to know more about her own actions because right now it's hard for me not to focus on the actions of Dave Halls. And we will see that in the prosecution's case which is why when we hear the judge give opening instructions, the judge is going to say, keep an open mind. I am going to try to keep an open mind, but I know that my internal gut response is, hey, Dave Halls, really? You got six months in a misdemeanor? Really? If he told her, you don't have time for a weapons check, give me the gun. I, I, I lived outside of Los Angeles. I worked with people who worked on sets a lot not the, always the actors, yes, sometimes, but the costumers and all of the people that make movies work and the power dynamics on movie sets are wild. And Hollywood is absolutely an industry where if you're the problem once, you are never working again. So the uh, your career is dependent on this is very true. So uh, the judge got a new chair. Dean said in the chat, she allowed real bullets on the movie set. And I've, that allegation is new from the last court hearing. If that is true, my feelings will change. If she negligently brought live rounds onto set, my feelings will absolutely change. Absolutely change. So we're gonna just see. All right, so the judge is back in chambers. I'm gonna catch up to real time on the feed. And um, we're, gonna, we're gonna get to see how long a streamer can, can just talk to chat while we're, <laughs> while we're waiting for court. I'll check Twitter at some point and see if we have any more updates on that juror. Um, but we're going to answer questions. Let's see. KJ in the chat said, Qu uh, question, if that's true about Dave Halls, can his plea deal be void? Not really. Or can he get in trouble for that? No, he pled. The only way Dave Hall's plea deal can be voided if he doesn't testify in court, if he doesn't testify truthfully, if he doesn't show up in court. That can void his plea deal, but I, I can... We can pull up his plea deal in a little bit. I mean, I don't know how much time we will have. Um, SpongeBob uh, ripped in the chat said she was high on drugs on the set. I haven't seen evidence of that yet. So if that is true, my feelings will change. But I don't know if she was ever drug tested and I wonder if that's speculation. But if that is true, my feelings will change. I'm trying to keep an open mind. I'm just telling you where I'm at. Motion for sweatpants merch. Becky, we will, we can look into it. I'll make a note. I know Chris is watching. We'll take a note on sweatpants. Um, today we're launching the black on black law nerd sweatshirt. So this is, this is launching this morning. So, uh, that's exciting stuff. I know Baldwin's attorneys are watching carefully. Yes. Yes. Question. How do they prove she is the one that brought them on set? I don't know. Is this all on her bosses? Cause sorry, I need more than that. I don't know how they prove it. I don't know how they prove it. I don't know. We're going to find out together. Cass the said, I need sweatpants. We have motions with, we have lots of motions for sweatpants. Okay. 
Question, I found something regarding Colin versus Cuthbert. Should I send it to your email? Yes. Email is the best place. Email is the best place to send case stuff. In the app, we're going to be setting up a place um, for members to do that, but we have not yet. So for all of you asking, how long is this trial supposed to be? Three weeks. Three weeks is what we are. Three weeks is what we are thinking, but we'll see. Um, I'm from New Mexico. Local news said she wasn't tested. DA Grace, that's what I've heard too, that she was never drug tested. So I don't know if they can prove that. How do you prove it? You can't, prosecutors can't just speculate and be like, she's in her 20s and she's texting about smoking weed. Obviously she's high on set. That's not evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. That's not proper evidence. It's not relevant. Uh, Snowy said, what's the difference between a special prosecutor and a prosecutor? <laughs> Snowy, I'm going to rephrase, and this has absolutely nothing to do with you and everything to do with South Carolina. I'm going to rephrase. Well, what makes a special prosecutor so special? When they were asking the female special agents, well, what makes you special? The, in this case, the special prosecutor, and generally a special prosecutor, indicates an attorney who is not an employee of the prosecutor's office. The prosecutor's office in this district in New Mexico is a very small prosecutor's office, and they brought in another attorney that is not hired by the DA's office to be the prosecutor on this case. So special prosecutor indicates that she was brought on for this trial, for this role. Not something that really happened in Los Angeles when I was there, because there were, at the time, over a thousand DAs, and there were DAs that did all kinds of different stuff, um, but there were always enough of them. <laughs> So it was never, we were never bringing in special prosecutors from outside. Sometimes this will happen if there's a conflict with the prosecutor's office. They will bring in special prosecutors either from um, the criminal bar, which is generally defense attorneys, or from others, or they will bring in, um, they will bring in the U.S. attorneys. They will bring in federal prosecutors. Court is getting back in session. I'm going to answer as many questions as I can. Let's just go. Um let's just go i this judge is probably chomping kenical heart thank you for the gift of memberships i want you to sit next to the jurors over millie here. thank you for the gift of memberships yeah. the judge is talking to her ja about where to sit sue thank you for the gift of memberships i know we've got a bunch of these stacy thank you dana thank you barbara thank you kelsey thank you susan thank you I saw B2 in here too with 20 gifted memberships. B2, thank you. You guys, I was told by my YouTube rep that the Lawnard community is the most uh, passionate and engaged community he has ever seen on YouTube. And he works with creators that you would 100% know okay, that have uh, 10x my subscriber minute. numbers. And I'm like, oh, we're mighty. All right, we're on the record. Oh, we are. Court's in session, are here. you guys. All jurors are here. All jurors are here. And um, Court TV asked me to put on the record uh, what they cannot um, show. And it's the first video? Correct. Okay. It, who's, where's Court TV? Anybody, a representative that I can focus on? All right. So do you have any, qu hmm? do you have any questions? Okay. Hmm? Oh. Grace is the on-site. Hannah, right? Grace. Oh, Grace. On-site producer for okay. TV. Grace, remember, remember we talked? Yes. Okay, so this is one of those Thank you, videos Chaos. that we don't want to show. So it's going to be her first uh, witness. Allie, thank you. And it'll be the first exhibit. First exhibit, first witness. Carrie, thank you. That's why we have multiple cameras, so we'll show anything but that video. And not the jurors. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. Paula Abdul. All right. I get okay, that so we're gonna call in the jurors. I get that Hannah can't giggle, um, because it's hard. But she looks like she's gonna barf. Uh, I imagine she feels like she's going to barf. So, uh, Court TV is clear that they can't um, they can't show the first video. It's probably crime scene video. But we will see. They're already ready for the first witnesses. Opening statements are going to be short, so we should be getting to opening instructions and opening statements shortly. I'm gonna. You know what? I'm going to just do this now. Emily, how many times are you going to use StreamYard to move your move your video all the time? Because I can do it in real time. So I don't like hide behind y'all's super chats. 
Uh, Emily said, I love live court with EDB. Y'all, if you're new here, go ahead and download the Law Nerd app so you don't miss anything. Our goal is when there are key witnesses, Seth Kinney, Sarah Zachary, the people that were in the church, um, Joel Souza, we're going to send you alerts to the Law Nerd app to let you know when those witnesses take the stand. Because I understand you have to have meetings, pick up kids, deal with a husband who has COVID. Maybe that's just me. Like you have things that happen in life. So we're going to let you know in the app when key moments are happening in trial. If you can't get back here live, they're all going to be time stamped down below. We're going to time stamp by witness. And so you always know what's happening and you can come back and, and take a look in the replay crew so you don't miss a minute of live court. There's going to be some interruptions with travel. Uh, talk to the Dave Matthews band about their, their desire to always play right around leap day every four years. It, it just, it's a thing. And, um, and, and I, I feel like if we go back to Vegas, because the last time we were in Vegas to see Dave was um, February 29th, 2020. And I feel like maybe if we go back there, we can reset onto a better timeline. That I, I don't know. That's my hope. Let's all just like, t we're all going to sing together and like maybe bounce us off whatever timeline we're on and like shift it into a different one. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's just me. Um, welcome to all our new members. Thank you, EDB, for everything you do. You are welcome. I've got coffee. Oh, jurors are coming in. I've got coffee. I've got cursey words. I've got water. I've got water. I've got water. We've got our pickle, if need be. A really sassy mockingbird outside my window. And of course, we have Vincent Van Gogh. I feel like it's going to be needed. These attorneys have come in hot this entire case. Like this entire case. Every time the prosecutor talks to the defense attorneys, she sounds like she wants to rip their All face right, off. Maybe seated. So, do I have the Chroma Stanley yet? No. I'm waiting for All it. All right, the matter I'm calling is State of New Mexico versus Hannah Gutierrez, D101CR, 202340. Colby, Colby I can. Name. That's a me issue, so I can Good see morning, the chat. Jason Lewis and Jerry Morrison, on the that is a me issue, so I can Good see morning, chat. Jason Lowell's, Carmelo Cisneros, and Todd William are here for Hannah Gutierrez. Reviews. Let's see if I can All put right, these in a separate much. window. All right, jurors. So I, um, first of all, thank you for your patience. Um, as they say, accidents happen. So thank you. All right. So I'm going to uh, give you an explanation. Somebody's late because of a car accident and that's her quip. I'm going to fucking love this judge. The trial procedure. Can you all hear me? Okay. Um, yeah, we need, do we need, um, see the forward. problem is the video will freeze, which is so frustrating. Oh, maybe not. Hello. No, the video freezes. Yeah, when I do what I need to do, sadly, the video freezes. So it's not going to be edge to edge because, well, let's see. No, it freezes. It's not going to be edge to edge because I still need to be able to see. You ready? Okay. That. Okay, so I call the so. case. So this is a criminal case commenced by the state charging. So I will do my best. Uh, the uh, defendant with a third amended criminal information. I will uh, read this to you to remind you of what the charges are. Uh, it sounds formal. Count one, involuntary manslaughter. In that honor about October 21, 2021, in Santa Fe County, New Mexico, at the Bonanza Creek Ranch, located at 545 Bonanza Creek Road, Santa Fe, New Mexico, 87508. The above named defendant did cause the death of Helena Hutchins, committed in the commission of an unlawful act, to wit, negligent use of a deadly weapon. In the alternative, count one, involuntary manslaughter. Oh, she in took that out honor her, about October 21, 2021, in Santa Fe County, New Mexico, at the Bonanza Creek Ranch, yeah, located at 545 Bonanza Creek Road, Santa Fe, New Mexico, 87508. The above named defendant did cause the death of Helena Hutchins, committed in the commission of a lawful act which might produce death in an unlawful manner or without due caution or those are the two action. in the alternatives count two tampering with evidence in that honor about october 21 2021 in santa fe county new mexico 
the above named defendant to transfer narcotics to another person with the intent to prevent the apprehension, prosecution, or conviction of herself. And the thank you. All right. Yeah. The uh, the jury. So gonna remember be like, that what? Uh, Ms. Hannah Gutierrez is presumed innocent. The she burden was not is on the state plea. to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Opening jury instructions. Uh, I have some instructions now. to give you. These are, are uh, instructions that you'll follow throughout the trial. First of all, the most one of the most important is all of you must pay custody. close attention to the evidence. After you've read all of the evidence, I will read the final instructions of law to you. You will also receive a written copy of all instructions. You must follow the final instructions in deciding the case. Again, the trial is expected to last um, uh, possibly through May 8th. Wait, what? And um, No, ma'am, March 8th. March 8th, not May 8th. Ma'am, what? It, we're here every day except the weekends, 8, 8.30 to 5, okay? March! Um, March! We'll take a morning break. We'll take a lunch break. Not we'll May. take an afternoon break. March. Um, They're going to correct see. her. Please report to uh, where you've reported today uh, at 8.30 so we can start. If you know you might be late for some reason, please leave early. <laughs> um, do not come into the courtroom unless you are accompanied by George, my bailiff. You may take water into the courtroom with you, but um, no hot liquid or coffee. We stand up out of respect for you because you are the ultimate decision makers as to the facts in this particular case. So when you come into court, go ahead, be seated. And after all of you are seated, we will be seated. Courts are like church. It is so important you know, to hear. There's lots of Do not ritual. miss one word. Raise your hand, don't wait, don't be shy, okay? There's, there's pews. Uh, this is a public proceeding. So people may go in and out. You may find yourself looking at who is going in and out. But after a while, I think you'll get used to it. However, if there is anything distracting like, you from being able to don't listen be ADHD. and be involved in the case, please tell George and he'll let me know. Really can't uh, do anything about the temperature. So is it hot um, or cold? As I said, uh, layers. Cold. You are allowed but not required to take notes during Three trial. Weeks. George will hand you each a notepad and a pen or pencil. Please put your name on the front of the page, on the front of the uh, pad, and then take notes beginning on the second page. On breaks, leave them on your chair or have follow what George says, leave or take back to the jury room. George is the boss. Uh, he'll collect the, them uh, at the end of the day and in the morning he'll return them. Please don't worry about your notes being read by anyone. They're locked up at night and then at the end of the trial, they're shredded immediately, okay? Oh, I like a manicure. Don't let your notes take the place of your independent memory of the evidence. When taking notes, please don't forget to pay close attention to the witnesses during their Thank testimony you, because it will help you assess their appearance, behavior, memory, and whatever else bears on their credibility. Let's go through the order of trial for um, any of you that have not been like through a criminal trial. I like this judge's demeanor a lot. A criminal trial generally begins with the lawyers telling you what they expect the evidence to show. This is called opening statements. These statements made by the lawyers during the course of trial can be of considerable assistance to you in understanding the evidence as it is presented at trial. Statements of the Court lawyers, George. however, are not themselves evidence. The evidence will be the testimony of the witnesses, exhibits, and any facts agreed to by the parties. After you have heard all of the evidence, I will then give you final instructions on the law. The lawyers will argue the case, that's called closing argument, and then you will retire to the jury room to arrive at a verdict. It is my duty to decide what evidence you may consider. Your job is to find and determine the facts in this case, which you must do solely upon the evidence received here in court. It is the duty of the lawyer to object to questions, testimony, or exhibits the lawyer believes may not be proper, and you must not hold such objection against the objecting party. I Unless will it's sustain a lane. objections if the question or evidence yeah, sought is improper speculate. for you to consider. If I sustain an objection to evidence, hold it you them. must not consider such evidence, At some nor may you consider so any evidence that I have told you to disregard. That they do hold it against By them. itself, a question is not evidence. You must not speculate about what would be the answer to a question that I rule cannot be answered. 
It is for you to decide whether the witnesses know what they are talking about and whether they are being truthful. You may give the testimony of any witness whatever weight you believe it merits. You may take into account, among other things, the witness's ability and opportunities to observe, memory, manner, or any bias or prejudice that the witness may have, and the reasonableness of the testimony considered in light of all of the evidence in the case. I think that's the, the most important jury instruction that she no just read. No ruling, gesture, or comment I make during the course of the trial should influence your decision in this case. At times, I may ask questions of witnesses. If I do, such questions do not in any way indicate my opinion about the facts or indicate the weight I feel you should give to the testimony of the witness. Questions by jurors. Ordinarily, the attorneys will develop all pertinent evidence. It is the exception rather than the rule that an individual juror will have an unanswered question after all of the evidence is presented. However, if you feel an important question has not been asked or answered, write it down on a piece of your note paper and give it to George before the witness leaves the stand. The jurors get to ask questions. Oh, New Mexico, you're going to be my favorite. I will decide whether or when your question so will be asked. Rules of evidence or other considerations apply to questions you submit and may prevent yes, we're the gonna, question we're from gonna being asked. Night if the question the is not asked, please do not give it any further consideration. Do not discuss it with the other jurors. And please do not hold it against either side that you did not get an answer. Not every Conduct jurisdiction jurors. allows jurors to ask questions. You must, again, decide the case That's solely upon the evidence received in, in court. Case. You must not consider anything you may have read or heard about the case outside the courtroom. During the trial and your deliberations, you must avoid news accounts of the trial, whether they be on radio, television, YouTube. the internet, YouTube. or in a newspaper or other written publication. TikTok. You must not visit the scene of the incident on your own. You cannot make experiments with reference to this case. Yeah, no you cannot experimenting. Google anything about this case. Do any research will end up about shot. the subject matter of the case. Just sit and listen, y'all. Just sit and listen. And that would include anything regarding this. Just, just listen. Uh, That's pre it. Sit or current. Sit, listen. Sit, stay. Listen. If an exhibit is until you retire, this is very important. Until you retire to deliberate the case. Do not discuss. And that means after closing argument, when you've received all the evidence, discuss. you must not discuss this case or the evidence with anyone, even with each other. So as I said yesterday, I'm sorry to harp, but this is so important. It is what so important. What I said yesterday was you cannot, while you're in that jury deliberation room, that is not a time for you to discuss uh, the case while you're sitting around. No, it's, as I said, after all of the evidence, that'll be down the line, March 8th, That's in, and we send you off to deliberate. That's when you can discuss the case, when you're in deliberations, okay? Um, let's see. If an exhibit is admitted in evidence, you should examine it yourself and not talk about it with other jurors until you retire to deliberate. It is important that you keep an open mind and not decide any part of the case until the entire case has been completed and submitted to you. Your special responsibility as jurors demands that throughout this trial, you exercise your judgment impartially and without regard to any sympathy, bias, or prejudice. To minimize the risk of accidentally overhearing something that is not evidence in this case, please continue to wear the jurors' badges while in and around the courthouse. So people know not if to say shit around you. If someone happens to discuss you. the case in your presence, report that fact to George immediately. Although it is natural to visit with people you meet, please do not talk with any of the attorneys, parties, witnesses, or spectators either in, a, in or out of the courtroom. If you meet in the hallways or elevators or elsewhere, there is nothing wrong with saying a good morning or a good Good afternoon, but your conversation should end there. If the attorneys, parties, and witnesses do not greet you outside of the courtroom or avoid riding in the same elevator with you, to. they are not being rude. They are just don't ask them out on dates. Carefully observing this rule, and they definitely wanted me to tell you that so that um, it's a you, problem. You, you, know, you don't. You don't think they're, they're rude. rude? They don't want to okay. feel like they're dicks if they don't look at you All and right, they get so out we'll of an elevator. If you get in. Rule. Yes, Your Honor. All right, and we will begin the, the evidence. Thank, no, not the evidence. The exclusion rule is that witnesses can't be in to hear other witnesses. Just yeah. the rule of Why are we approaching? Oh, because she needs to designate. I'm going to answer some questions. She needs to designate a 
investigating officer for the rule of exclusion. Elizabeth said, I wonder if Hannah's stepdad said, get my name out of your mouth. I don't think so. I would imagine that this was a strategic thing with the attorneys to not more closely associate her with Theo Reed. Um, if anybody knows him, if anybody's in the movie industry there, just because he is such a legend in the field, it might be to make her seem more like, you know, a man on an island. I'm going to get to some more of your questions. EDB, did you watch that documentary on Vice with Bretta Hoft? No. Um, I know that I'm in it. I have not watched it. I will when I have time. Is George the Becky of this court? Ciara, I hope not. But George is the bailiff, not the clerk of court. The clerk of court is probably not in this. Each courtroom will have a clerk, which is probably um, one of the two women sitting to the side of the judge. Um, I haven't seen where the court reporter sits yet because we haven't gotten like a pan out of the courtroom. But there's going to be a judicial assistant, a court clerk, a court reporter, and then the bailiff. George is the bailiff. EDB, are fidget devices allowed in court? Generally not, though I think that people who are neurodivergent should be able to ask to have fidget devices in court because sitting through testimony is really difficult. Kaylee asked, how much time is she facing? Um, her maximum is prison time. I think it is four years plus like three for the tampering, so maybe seven, but she's also eligible for probation in this case. So it, I don't know if she will get jail or prison time in this case. She's never been in custody, so we'll see um and right. have poker faces but i said may 8th you did i meant march 8th thank god okay. i told you she'd fix it i told you she'd fix it i screamed panic I, there but I, I nobody, yelled nobody showed their panic i did right, so may, uh, i panicked march 8th. okay now panic. i'm going to remind that you will hear this it will sound there's going to be two things that sound like a broken record and one is don't talk to every anybody time we take a break or whatever don't do look at any info yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court very important the other thing is because um we are doing court tv i don't know if you all know that um, we're doing edb people we're doing edb i thank you court tv for, for for providing the feed but we're doing edb up in here but and by the way they're not filming you they're not allowed to film you i will so, kill them um don't worry about that. Her and then because it. you're wearing your juror, juror badges, they will know to leave you alone in and around the courthouse and lunch and everything, whatever. Okay. Now, um, I will be saying a lot uh, that the witnesses may not be watching the live stream court TV. That's important to uh, so that they're not hearing the evidence. That's what they just asked me to do. So that will these come lawyers I think of it. These lawyers must have been watching out, the Murdoch the case. May get on the the uh, live stream and have missed my um, direction, although they should know it anyway. Okay, all right. So I I did say we'll start the evidence, but that that's actually wrong. You're going to start opening start statements. Opening statement, which is not evidence. Okay. I can't wait. Thank you. Opening statements are my favorite. Oh, you're giving the opening. Hey. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. That's a surprise. Honor, counselors. I'm going to shut the fuck up. Uh, my name is Jason Lewis, and I know that we were introduced briefly yesterday during the jury selection process. I wanted to introduce myself again. I sped him uh, up. My this is the attorney that talks slower than my ADHD can process, so I've sped him up until we catch back up. But um, he's going to introduce everybody. Opening statements are my favorite. They are not allowed to argue. This is not evidence. If they start arguing, I will start screaming. Co counsel is Carrie Morrissey, who most of you spoke to, uh, at least in some oh, she did uh, to, to yesterday. some degree yesterday. Also at council table is Shad Bo. He is our IT specialist and Corporal Alexander Hancock. Uh, she is what's called our case agent, and she is a witness who you will be hearing from uh, later, maybe maybe later today, if not certainly by tomorrow. Um, as the judge mentioned earlier, it is Ms. Morrissey's and mine responsibility to prove to your all satisfaction that Ms. Gutierrez committed the two crimes with which she's been charged uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, yes. The two crimes she's been charged with are involuntary manslaughter and tampering with evidence. Um, this morning, I hope to give you a roadmap Good. of what we intend I to need a introduce. Roadmap. 
uh, throughout the trial. The evidence and will show. And all the statements that I'm making this morning aren't evidence, and you can't consider what I'm saying for purposes of your deliberation. Well, the judge already said that. Uh, I just I hope to give you a preview of what the evidence is about, uh, what witnesses you're going to be hearing from, uh, and again, kind of highlight some of the key pieces of evidence that we think we're going to be showing you uh, throughout the trial. Yes. But most importantly, uh, what we want to do is give you the information that you need to answer two key, two key questions. How did the live um, rounds the get first on set? Being, what are the events that happened on the set of Rust that led to the death of Helena Hutchins? And the second question is, uh, how did live ammunition end up on the set of the movie? As to both questions, we believe uh, that it was the negligent acts and failures of the defendant, Ms. Gutierrez, that resulted uh, in both the acts that contributed to Ms. Hutchins' death and to the live rounds being uh, brought onto the set. Uh, a bit later on, I'm going to uh, explain to you exactly how we believe that happened. I would love um, to know. Give me just a minute. Nope. Technology always makes it slow. I didn't use a lot of tech in my opening statements because I never wanted to do this. I literally did my opening statements the way I talk to y'all when I do a road so far. on the screen for you guys, like, but there's a little process we have to go through to get leg that going. Legitimately, um, the way I talk to y'all, less curse words, um, unless it came up. But the way I talk to y'all is basically the way I did my opening statements. Because we're just trying to teach everybody about the law. Thank Sir, you. I'm going to answer some questions. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Helena Hutchins. Um, this is the victim in the case that we're here to deal with this morning. Uh, Miss Hutchins was born in Ukraine on hey, April 9th, 1979. I like that they're humanizing she was the married. victim here. Her husband's name is Matthew. She has a and she has child. one son who was nine years old uh, at the time of her death. Amy, good As a to child, see you Ms. in between Hutchins lived uh, on a Russian military base loaded, located in the Arctic. Um, she took an was early and keen interest in film and Questions. journalism. Uh, she studied both economics and journalism at the Kiev National University, uh, where she received a degree in international journalism. Miss Hutchins met her husband, Matthew, uh, when she was working in the United States in Los, An in Los Angeles, California. Uh, they hit it off so well that they eventually got married. Uh, and when Miss Hutchins moved and immigrated into the United States, uh, she continued her education and she eventually earned a master's degree in 2015 from the American Film Institute Conservatory. While in Los Angeles, Ms. Hutchins transitioned into the film and television industry, working as a cinematographer. Um, this was a job that she loved and she had a great passion for. Um, for those of you, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I apologize. My microphone has been off this whole time and I didn't know. We um, couldn't tell. For those of you who may not know, a cinematographer uh, is a person who works behind the scenes on a film. Fine. And uh, the cinematographer is responsible for creating the overall vision of the film. Uh, in very basic terms, the, cin the cinematographer decides no! how the movie will be lit and colored and how the final footage will appear on the screen when you watch the movie. Uh, and in fact, Miss Hutchins was working as a cinematographer for the movie Rust, uh, which when she how the movie will be lit and colored and how the final footage will appear on the screen when you watch the movie. Uh, and in fact, Miss Hutchins was working as a cinematographer for the movie Rust, uh, which when she was tragically shot and killed on October 21st, 2021. Um, by all accounts from the folks who knew her and worked with her, and many of those you will be hearing from, um, she was a gifted and talented artist, uh, but above all, she her. was a loving wife and mother. He does and talk slow. Like Miss Hutchins, uh, the defendant, Hannah Gutierrez, was also a behind-the-scenes member of the Rust crew. Miss um, Gutierrez was hired to perform a dual role on the movie. Um, she was hired to be both an armorer and a props assistant. As a props assistant, uh, it was Miss Gutierrez's primary duty to essentially go out and source and bring back to the film set everything that the actors need to touch as part of making the movie. So for example, if they're doing a kitchen scene, then Ms. Gutierrez would have gone out, purchased plates, cups, glasses, forks, all of that sort of stuff. Thank you, sir. And then those would have been incorporated into the set. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Gutierrez's other role was as the movie's armorer. 
And it's that role that really has brought us here today. The armor has a few key responsibilities. Um, the first responsibility is to source and bring to the set all of the firearms that are gonna be used as part of the movie. <clears throat> so for a modern movie, that may, it re that may have required her to purchase or uh, obtain machine guns, semi-automatic semi handguns, uh, long rifles, and that sort of thing. But for a Western like Rust, uh, the armorer would have to source weapons that were in use at the time so that the movie looks more authentic. And so that would include finding old looking revolvers uh, and shotguns Sir? Uh, and, and things of that nature. How did it happen? How did it happen? How just did it happen? Put up a photo. No, no, no. We know about the victim. This Tell us how it happened. The Don't get in the weeds. That Mr. Baldwin was using in this movie. Um, this is also the firearm that was uh, used in the incident that resulted in the death of uh, Miss Hutchins. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I think is important for you all to understand is that throughout this trial, we all may refer to these type of firearms as prop guns, but make no mistake, they are legitimate firearms. If you put a bullet, a live bullet inside of these guns, they will fire. So how did the bullet so get there? We sometimes refer to them as prop weapons, um, but real guns. they are absolutely capable of causing a projectile to fly out of the barrel. Um, the other thing uh, I, I that's feel important like for you all fly out of the is barrel that although is, the, this is not the technical term for this, sir, old, to shoot uh, it and is kill. actually a brand new gun. Uh, this gun was purchased directly from the manufacturer for this, for the purpose of being used in this movie. And although it looks old, right? uh, it has, it's not a gun that has had hundreds or thousands of rounds put through it. It was a brand new and perfectly functioning gun when it arrived on the set. Uh, the second thing that the armorer is responsible for is sourcing and purchasing blank and dummy ammunition. You're gonna be hearing a lot throughout this trial about the differences between live ammunition, blank ammunition, dummy ammunition. Yes, so we I'm will. just gonna kind of give you a 10,000 foot overview of, of what this stuff is. How did it get on set? The image though? that's on your screen right now is what's called a blank round. A blank round is actually pretty easy to distinguish because it has that crimped end where, a, where normally a bullet would be. Uh, the reason that blanks are used in the movie is because when it's in the gun and an actor pulls a trigger, uh, there is enough gunpowder inside of that blank to cause a pop and have a, a cloud of smoke Wadding come out from, from a the blank. Gun. But is it doesn't what killed have a Brandon Lee on the set of the crow that shoots through the barrel. So it of the was gun. wadding from a blank. So in that these case. are a type of uh, round that is used frequently on the movie sets, especially whenever they want to make uh, make it look like the actor is actually firing a weapon. The second type of round that is used on the sets are what's called dummy rounds, and these are a little bit. These are a yes, different story. Us. Dummies look exactly like real bullets. So As you can tell from how do you kind tell of the main apart, image then? there, although this uh, evidence dummy round has some writing on it, you wouldn't be able to distinguish that from a live bullet if you were just looking at it with your eyes. So why are we here? Uh, and because these dummy rounds are designed to look exactly like live ammunition, <clears throat> every round has to be thoroughly checked before it is put inside of one of these firearms. And how do you do that? Um, aside from sourcing firearms, blanks, and dummies for the movie, wait, no, uh, how do you tell them apart? The next major function Sir, that Hannah close the was loop. required to do on the movie set is that she was required to check every single one of these rounds uh, to make sure that it's a the appropriate blank or dummy Thanks, and Anna. not live ammunition before it gets inserted into the gun. And there are two primary ways 
uh, that an armorer or anybody who's familiar with this can check to make sure that a, a round is a dummy round. The first thing they can do is shake it. And if you'll see in that, uh, on the lower right hand side, we, I've got a photograph for you there. Are those of the a balls? Plastic container that's got three BBs in it. Um, those BBs are inside of that dummy round so that whenever you shake it, you can audibly hear that it's making a noise. And that way, you know, it's a dummy round. She Sometimes didn't shake them individually as part of the problem there, here. Rather than these bullets, but they always have some sort of noise maker in there. Uh, the other way to distinguish a dummy from a real I'm live bored, bullet a different pen. is in that top right photograph. And you'll see that that, uh, that cartridge has a hole drilled into the side of the casing. That's real clear. That's the second way that you can distinguish a dummy round That's from a live round. That's pretty fucking clear. It's a big ass hole. And then we have, hole? not to overcomplicate things, no but I think hole. it's important that you know this. We also have some dummy rounds that are missing what's called the primer. Uh, normally on a, on a live cartridge, there's a, an, ex, uh, an explosive element that is inside of that center portion that whenever the hammer of the gun hits that primer, it causes a small spark that then ignites For the everyone that was the on the members only live last night, I'm sorry And causes the, for my uh, the projectile to I, be expelled. Sorry. So dummy rounds, happened. as you can see, as you can see, uh, they do look an awful lot like live ammunition. There's a big but hole. But there are ways, if you are careful, that you can distinguish a, uh, a dummy round from a live round. The next major function is the, of the armor is to check the firearm before it is brought on to the set. Um, and there's a very specific process that is used for this. Uh, when it's time for a firearm to be used, the armorer is required to present the firearm to the first assistant director to double check that only dummy rounds uh, are inside the gun. And the armorer is also supposed to offer the actor who is receiving the gun the opportunity to also have the gun inspected in front of them. <clears throat> You guys, we do have our, web, our weapons case, expert in the chat. Uh, Ms. Guterres did Ian not Rumpel, Rumpel, always Rumpel, adhere to these uh, um, safety Ian, procedures. You, you can link your channel. And you're going to hear from several witnesses who will testify block, that she it. often rushed through this critical step. Ian does a better uh, job of explaining skipped, weapons than And sometimes this. she skipped this check altogether. Ian, we linked your, your clam shorts video last night in the members only live. So <clears throat> let's turn... To what happened on October 21st, 2021. Yes, please. The let's. cast and crew of the Rust film were out at the Bonanza Creek Ranch, which is a, uh, a ranch located just outside the city limits of Santa Fe. Not all lawyers are riveting um, it's folks. It's several, several thousand acres large, and it has an old west style uh, town that's built there. It's in my and, thumbnail. Uh, often movies are filmed there and i've got an example an example photo here Look, just pictures. to kind of give you an idea Sir, you need of what pictures. the set looks like um it's your book made better with pictures fancy. my it's guy it's an old west looking town uh part part of the set and this is located a little bit away from the town itself is this church and it was at this church that the incident resulting in Miss Hutchins' death occurred. We're going to hear a lot um, about that. The evidence is going to show that on October 21st, it was a fairly chaotic day on the set of the movie. Um, the <laughs> evening before, a group of camera operators who had some concerns about various safety issues on set sent an email to the production team uh, indicating that they were going to be quitting. And so the next day, in response to this notice, did he say due to safety uh, the issues, producers I got decided to stopped. push ahead with filming anyway, and they decided to use less camera equipment than what was normally used, and they tried to just improvise and make do with what they had. Filming on the morning of the 21st was largely uneventful. The cast and crew filmed several scenes without any 
particular incidents occurring. The camera crew walked um, off due to safety issues. That's an incident. Up to the lunch hour, a small group of cast and crew were inside uh, the church working on getting some close-up shots of Alec Baldwin sitting on a church pew. Sir, this is a fascinating uh, case, and, and somehow... manipulating his uh, revolver. That scene was just completed my just before lunch, and so they called for a lunch break. Uh, and... That feels better. Let me back up just a little bit. No, let's not. Uh, before the lunch break was called, I, I want you all to see what was going on. Uh, this is... Oh, a right. We need video. So that gives you an idea of what was going on that morning. Uh, oh, that's not real Alan video. Bal that's the recreation. Baldwin was sitting on a church that's why pew. That's Uncanny and Valley. He was practicing this that looks draw like a recreation from his holster uh, with the camera crew. Maybe it's not close but up. That on looks top weird. The video looks kind of weird. So they completed that scene and they called for uh, the lunch hour to occur. Um, so Can we get the lunch during the lunch hour, Ms. Gutierrez took the gun from Mr. Baldwin and she uh, took it back to the, to the safe, the gun safe that was loaded on a prop cart. It's just a weird, the video um, looks weird. Once no, lunch if it's was a over, recreation, they should the say. The production decided that they wanted to continue working inside of the church. Um, but at this point, they weren't actually filming anything like they were in this oh, well, video that I just showed you. And instead they were doing what's called a blocking. And that is- Oh yes, we have missed our riveting film attorneys. Terms, what you do before you even get to a rehearsal. So it's like a very rough rehearsal where- Why am I so the picky lighting director, or prickly because I'm bored? The camera operator- He has bored me and already. All of the folks are trying to get things situated so that they can then I move into a rehearsal. Lawyers. Whenever a blocking is going on it's such an because case. they aren't filming, uh, there's really no need for the actor to have a live uh, firearm in their hands or even for the live firearm it's probably to his be, style. be on set. Um, you're going to hear from several witnesses or from one witness in particular uh, who's going to testify that for Lyndon's purposes right. of blocking, uh, Mr. Baldwin could have been using we, he makes a us stick, miss a lane. A rubber she gun. Wasn't boring. Uh, anything that would essentially allow him to mimic a gun. It didn't have to be a live firearm. Um, on that day, though, the defendant was asked to provide Mr. Baldwin with a live firearm for the blocking, uh, and she did, and and that was within her discretion to do so. I think the first AD told her to do it. Um, you're going to hear that on the day of the shooting, Ms. Gutierrez loaded the gun in the morning with five rounds. Uh, the revolver, this though, is, what is I want a six-shooter, so it can hold six rounds, but in that morning, she only was able to load five of them. Because one was wonky. Uh, after the lunch break was over, uh, Ms. Gutierrez retrieved the gun from the safe, and she cleaned that sixth hole and was able to put a sixth round into the sixth slot. Ms. Gutierrez then took the firearm to the church and handed the gun over to the first assistant director, whose name is Dave Halls. Ms. Ms. Gutierrez and Mr. Halls then did a sloppy and incomplete safety check of the gun where the dummy rounds were not removed from the gun and rattled or checked to see if they had a hole drilled in it. Instead, she just kind of cracked open the gun and partially sp spun the cylinder to show Mr. Halls a few of the rounds, but they were not removed from the gun Why? and they weren't all checked. Why? Is it because he told her not to? Uh, 3L and channel advocates, After don't forget to check your memo happened, spaces. And when Ms. Gutierrez was being interviewed don't by, to do that. by the investigating officers, uh, she stated that when she removed the gun from the safe to begin the filming uh, for the afternoon session, she didn't recheck the ammunition. So when she pulled the gun out and put the sixth bullet in, she didn't independently check the rounds at that time either. 
our witnesses are going to testify uh, that when the defendant pulled the gun out of the safe after the after lunch, what she should have done was open the gun and independently herself checked each and every round. Then when she took it to the church and handed it to Mr. Halls, she should have done a second complete ammo check with Mr. Halls because this double redundancy is what helps prevent this. the kind of incidents that occurred to Miss Hutchins from happening. This means she should have opened the gun, removed each cartridge, confirmed that they were dummy rounds by individually shaking them, rattling them, or seeing the board hole. Uh, not, and because not the board because hole, these dummy rounds like the hole are is so similar board to holes and live rounds, her decision to just crack true. it open and spin See. the cylinder a little bit to look at the head stamps wasn't enough. Go she ahead and put a board hole. Complete check. Put board hole on your bingo cards right now. So she failed to do that check herself. She then Spell it handed the firearm want. to Mr. Halls anyway. She exited the church, and then Mr. Halls handed the firearm to Mr. Baldwin. As the blocking session was underway, Mr. Hutchins and uh, excuse me, Miss Hutchins yes, and Chad, several I'm sorry. Of crewmates we're here. were busily working, looking through and adjusting cameras. Uh, and Mr. Baldwin was sitting on that church pew, uh, practicing how he would hold the gun for the upcoming filming session. Um, as Mr. Baldwin was manipulating the firearm, uh, it, he caused it to discharge, and that unfortunately sent a projectile. Uh, flying directly at Miss Miss Hutchins. Can we? Uh, the projectile. Can we shot stop saying flying at her? Like, and then struck the film's director, Joel have you never Souza, shot a gun? in the shoulder. Counsel, the languaging is just so. No, it's just a personal so this bother. Point, I was a DA. The set paramedic I'm harder on was DAs. called into the church. And began life-saving efforts bullet on at both Miss Hutchins and Mr. Souza. Another crew member who was in the church called 911 to report the shooting. Maybe he wants to give the imagery to of it being all willy-nilly and scattered, but flying but because at her of the is not what I location, It took it. some time before additional medical per personnel arrived, um, and and this additional support also included a, a life flight helicopter for Miss Hutchins. Um, a team of medical personnel worked to stabilize Does her. Does that have anything to do with the uh, involuntary and they placed manslaughter? Her on the life flight to UNMH, um, but sadly, the personnel at UNMH were unable to overcome the injuries that she sustained. She was shot uh, and killed, and she was pronounced deceased at UNMH. And that we sucks. We will show you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, but that by failing to make those vital safety checks. There we go. Uh, the defendant acted neg acted negligently and without due caution. And Reckless. the decisions she made that day ultimately contributed to Miss Hutchins' death. So that's what happened on the 21st. But now I want to talk to you a little bit about what happened leading up to the 21st. That's important. There are some other ways that Miss Hutchins... This is the prosecution's me, opening Ms. statement. Ms. was negligent on the set. It's... We intend to call several witnesses to give Love. testimony that she regularly failed to properly carry out her duties as an armorer. That would be interesting uh, to know. These witnesses are going to describe the defendant's conduct as unprofessional and sloppy. You will hear testimony that she routinely left guns and ammunition lying around the set. This unattended. is the best part of his opening so far. And that her gun safe and ammo cart were constantly disorganized. Should have led the with second this, sir. Question that, we that was want good. To answer for you is where these live bullets came from. Yes, it's the only thing. The we prospect know. of live ammunition landing up on a film set is incomprehensible. It's something that should never happen. Yes, uh, it's a hard and fast industry rule that live ammunition should be miles away from a film set at all times because of the risk that it poses for being confused with the dummy rounds that are used on the set. Okay, if y'all were sleeping, this is the best part of opening. This is where he's actually telling us things. Sir, I'm don't stop now. showing you a picture now of a box of ammunition uh, that Miss Gutierrez says she was pulling cartridges from 
uh, and loading into Mr. Baldwin's fire uh, firearm on the day of the fatal shooting. It says 45 occurred. long count dummies, um, long Colt dummies. If you dummies. can see the arrow that I'm kind of wiggling around here, this is the box of ammunition that she was pulling from. This is a box of dummies. This second box here is a box of blanks. So these are the kind of rounds that will pop and create smoke. These are the type of rounds that are just supposed to be completely inert. Shit. You are flawless with the wiggle it just a when little bit. When the officers bit. arrived on the set. Sir, where uh, were the live rounds? The shooting. This cart is where those two boxes of, boxes of ammunition were first found. Um, when the officer who uh, was in charge of this prop cart uh, uncovered that the boxes on there were, were the ones that were being used for that day's filming, he then placed them into his police unit. And that's what you saw in those previous slides. Well, that's helpful. Uh, these are the boxes of ammunition inside of a cop car. Where were the live ones? Eventually, uh, these... The, the box of dummies was Bethany, uh, that's totally taken fair. back to the Santa Fe Sheriff's Office, totally fair. where it was inventoried and photographed by a crime scene, a crime scene technician I am whose glad name I'm not is Marissa Popple, and she's going to be a witness in this case. Um, the first box of dummies that was opened up is what is on your monitors right now. Uh, this is a styrofoam container that has approximately 37 cartridges in, in it. Uh, according to the label well, on the outside look. of the box, uh, these are supposed to be dummy no. cartridges. And I don't know if you've noticed yet, but there is one of these cartridges that doesn't look like the others. Did you? Are you it's going with one of these things that's not like the others? With the red square, uh, you can see that it has a silver primer. Best part of the whereas opening. all of the other ones have brass primers mixed into the mixed into the box the cartridge in that red box is a live bullet so this was another live bullet that was found on the set not just the one he that was have in Mr. With Baldwin's this. firearm and then backed up with the rest of it ultimately you're going to hear from us that there were not just these two but a total of six live bullets that were found on the set six you're also going to hear that all six Where of those live from? rounds have the same uh have common characteristics of having this silver or nickel covered primer a shiny brass casing and what's called a starline brass head stamp look completely different. i don't know if you can tell in your monitors or not but this the this impression Court TV that is on the each switching. of these cartridges well done looks like a star and then a line and a star uh that that indicates that it's a star line brass manufactured so casing. they all have the same head stamp so we knew from the evidence gathered on october 21st uh and timing when TV we had production. these rounds uh examined by the fbi uh we discovered that there were actually those six live rounds on set and so our next step was to determine whether there was any way if we could tell when those live rounds ended up on the set. Um, so we began Your to brain is seeking stimulation. all of the photos and videos that had been recorded on the set from the very first day of the filming began. And we started to notice something. We were able to identify several points in time where the cartridges with a silver primer and a, and a shiny brass cartridge ended up being spotted inside of the gun belts and bandoliers that the cast members were wearing on the set. That's fucking troubling. Um, in fact, we found a- Lead with that. Oh, I had to pause him. Lead with that. Lead with, as we went back, what we saw was these silver primer heads in the bandoliers in what the cast was wearing you're bearing the lead my guy where there was one occasion where a live round was sitting right on miss guterres's lap and she failed to identify wait it. where wait where where is it sitting on her lap 
I don't see it. Is it in here? Put a red box around it. What you're looking now, <clears throat> what you're looking at now is a photograph of Ms. Gutierrez and on her lap in the oh, lower right hand in. corner, you can see that styrofoam uh, casing holder. I'm going to show you a, a call out. Yes. That's been enhanced a little bit. Make it bigger. And you can see, Big I hope biggin. you can see on your monitor that these bullets here kind of on the top right appear to have a brass casing but those have these silver other, at least these other two bullets most definitely uh this cartridge that's in the blue circle you can see that there is a silver primer this is 12 days um, before the shooting i imagine on that that's what the on, on that prosecution keeps arguing. and we believe uh that that was a live bullet sitting on her lap and she failed to identify that's it. a good day at work as a prosecutor when you find this photo that's a good day at work as a prosecutor when you are like, am I seeing what I think I'm seeing? It's important that you know that this photograph was yeah, that's taken not on good. October 10th. And the reason it's important for you to, to make note that this photograph was taken on October 10th is yeah, because bad for the other dummy rounds that were purchased for this movie didn't even arrive to the set until October 12th. So this means that the- That's important. This photo was taken before the other boxes came on set, which means the actual live rounds got onto set before it came from the prop house. That's fucking critical. Sir, Why raise your voice, change your tone. This is really important. The live ammunition could not have been- I'm backing up. This is critical. This is critical to this case. Because the other dummy rounds that were purchased for this movie didn't even arrive to the set until October 12th. That's a big deal. So this means that the, the live ammunition could not have been from the shipment that came in on October 12th. That's why the prop and, has to and be that prosecuted. Belonged or that was supplied by somebody other than uh, Ms. Gutierrez. Supplied by somebody other than Ms. Gutierrez? This also will help you. Uh, Supplied by somebody other than Seth Kinney. The defendant's counsel who are likely going to suggest to you that there was some kind of this is not time uh, for sabotage on uh, a foot on the set or that the live rounds came from someone other than Ms. Uh, Ms. Gutierrez. This photograph, we think, uh, will help you conclude uh, that the live rounds were on set on the 10th and that the other bullet, the other uh, dummy rounds didn't arrive until the 12th. How did they get there? We also have a little bit more evidence that these live rounds came onto the set via the defendant a when little, she came to New Mexico. Just a little bit, the state. just a little bit more evidence. Sure, um, and uh, As you can us. see from this photo, this is the box of rounds. This is kind of a blown up photograph of the box Good of rounds that she was pulling from on the that's day of the a, shooting. That's a big fact. And you can see that it has a very specific label on it. I don't know if it landed 45 with long the jury, though, dummies. Because his delivery and then doesn't in land. much smaller print there in the middle, you can see the initials JS. <clears throat> what does so on mean? November 9th, uh, a couple of weeks after the shooting, the defendant came into the Santa Fe Sheriff's Office uh, for an interview with Corporal Hancock, and she was asked questions about the box of ammunition she was pulling from the day of the uh, incident, this box with the small JS on the label. Uh, the defendant told Corporal Hancock that, the, that she thought this box was kind of peculiar and she wasn't certain where it came from, but she said that she didn't believe it was one of the uh, boxes that was originally brought on set. But then the defendant offered to Corporal Hancock that the day prior to the interview, she had asked her father back home uh, to text her a photograph of the box of 45 long cult dummies that they had at his home. And she texted him uh, and he texted her this photo in response. It's identical. It's the same box. The box this is how of they're dummies trying she to was say pulling she from on the 21st 
is identical to the box of dummies that her father had at home. So we believe this is more evidence that, that she brought this box of dummies with the live round in it came from the defendant. Yeah, he misspoke earlier when he said did not come from her. He means that he thinks we're also going to show you how these her. live rounds slowly spread their way throughout the set eventually landing in several of the actors costumes and firearms on october 13th 15th 17th and of course on the 21st show us all the photos in the image on your screen now oh shit. you can see uh in the the large photograph i can see that that's the bandolier that mr baldwin was wearing on the 21st that's uh that's a problem there is a live round inside of two. that bandolier. There's, sir, there's two the black can, belt that's if i can see it from right here corner is a belt that was worn by another cast member there's a live round in that belt too oh shit the evidence you're going to hear throughout this trial the photos are going to be the, the best evidence in this case unprofessional and that she failed to do the essential safety functions of her job and that these failures resulted in live ammunition being spread throughout she this should have been set. distinguishing it too once the live ammunition was on the set she failed to detect it because she didn't follow those essential safety protocols that required her to inspect every round before they were placed into the gun the evidence will show that the defendant For treated the safety protocols as if days. they were optional well so did Dave rather Paul's. than if people's lives counted on her doing her job correctly uh, we will show you they didn't that offer as a her direct a result of her failures, uh, Ms. Gutierrez call caused Ms. Hutchins death. The last, or I should say the second crime <clears throat> that Ms. Her, Ms. Gutierrez has been charged with. Yes. We would like to know more about the evidence. tampering with evidence. The evidence yeah. with regard to this charge is a lot more simple, a lot simpler. Um, you're going to hear testimony that on the day that Ms. Hutchins was killed and after the defendant left her interview at the sheriff's office, hey, you need to watch how to the her, jury reacts to she this went back to her hotel. Um, knowing that the defendant had probably been through a lot that day, one of her crewmates went to her room to check on her to see how she was doing. Um, and after they were done visiting, uh, the crew member got crew member got up to leave. And as she was walking out of the room, the defendant, the defendant handed her something and asked her to hang on to it for her. She At didn't first, say that. She said, hold this for me. Really I'm sure. Realize what she had been handed. So hold she this. walked out of the room, started down the hallway. And when she looked into her hand, she realized she had been handed a baggie of suspected cocaine from the defendant. Uh, she will testify that she was surprised that the defendant who is somebody she hardly knew would hand her a bag of would suspected like, cocaine this. to hang on to hang on to for her. Uh, the crew member is going to testify that she disposed of the cocaine. She didn't want to be caught with so it. How so how do you know it's cocaine? It um, and you're going to hear that the defendant over the next several weeks texted this crew member Yo, several you got times. My shit? asking her to return her stuff which the uh crew member is going to testify is in reference to the baggie of cocaine how do you know it's cocaine though i know i've gone through a lot of uh information with you guys and, and i hope you're not too overwhelmed uh, but that's where we're going to spend no, the next couple tired. of weeks with you going over all of this evidence in a lot more detail Just keep going through the photos dude the uh, photos, you're going to hear from the photos are real multitude. telling of law enforcement officers. The photos You're are gonna hear from real firearms time. experts. You're gonna hear from four FBI analysts covering the topics of fingerprints, DNA, explosives, comparisons, and firearms testing. They did chemical analysis You're gonna hear on from the different gun powders. Enhancement I'm ready for uh, expert. That. And most importantly, you're gonna hear from witnesses who worked with Ms. Gutierrez every day on the movie set, uh, including the film's director and several of the crew members who were inside the church on the day of this horrific incident. 
We're confident that after you hear from these witnesses and after you have an opportunity to look at the evidence for yourself in greater detail, you will agree with us that the defendant's actions were not only negligent on October 21st, yet. but on many days leading up to the 21st. Uh, we hope that after you review this information, uh, you will find her guilty of involuntary manslaughter. And after reviewing and hearing from the witness concerning the tampering charge, uh, we believe that you will also uh, convict her on the tampering with evidence charge as well. I'm about done, but I do want to leave you with one final statement. And this is a statement that Ms. Gutierrez made uh, when she was being interviewed on the day of the shooting. Should have led she with says this. At the end, I just, I don't know. I wish I would have checked it more. And so do we. Thank you. That's the beginning. That's the beginning of your opening. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. That's uh, the before beginning. Before we take yours, I think we'll take a bathroom break. Oh, thank okay? God. So please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. Um, so go ahead, George. That, that should have been the beginning and the end of his opening statement. The beginning of his opening statement should have been after Helena Hutchins was fatally shot on the movie set of Rust, the defendant, the armorer on the set said to law enforcement, I don't know. I wish I would have checked it more. And we're going to show you in this case with this evidence why she should have checked it more and how her failure to check it is why we are prosecuting her for involuntary manslaughter. And then loop it back around and do that at the end as well. Right, you may be seated. It's the um, whole theme. Like that's a big uh, fucking statement. Back here at uh, 20 up. Yes, sir. Okay. A 20 All right, minute you. break. Jesus. All right, y'all, let's get to some questions. Well, the court's taking a bathroom break. I think, I wonder if the the jury's eyes were, really, Court TV, we don't even get the seal of the state. The exit sign? The exit sign is what we've chosen? Okay. Okay, maybe I'm too critical of the prosecutor's opening argument because, or opening statement because his delivery is dry. His delivery's always been dry. He's very methodical, but at least we don't feel like we're getting yelled at. And the other prosecutor sometimes makes us feel like we're all just being scolded. So maybe it was better. Here's my takeaway. Let's give a quick, let's give a quick my takeaway from this opening statement. The photos in the interview are going to be damning in this case. The photos from 12 days before this fatal shooting showing that live rounds were getting mixed in to the props and on her um on her lap is going to be their best evidence i think i would have chosen if i could have to play a little clip of the video of her saying that her statement's a very very powerful statement um i don't know i wish i would have checked it more because what they have to show is that she was reckless um and though he gave us all of the information the storytelling wasn't riveting there are a lot of attorneys that are very good lawyers that are just uh not captivating in their delivery we've been very lucky with a lot of the cases that we've seen we've had very quirky attorneys love them or hate them we have had attorneys that have kept us engaged this one was a little bit harder um to stay engaged but the evidence was there and the evidence as we as we move through the evidence and we got to the second part the second part was receipts timeline screenshots fucking everything here are the photos that show the live rounds i didn't need him to tell me what an armorer needed to do he could have said in one sentence an armorer is responsible for the safety with the weapons on the set and the evidence will show that that was not done in this case. And these are the three different kinds of ammunition on this set. And look at these look at these bullets with that silver primer so that the jury is looking for that silver primer the entire case. The, the photographs were powerful, great use of photographs here. I don't think he needed as much, I can't look at this exit sign anymore. Court's on break. 
I don't think he needed as much background about what an armorer did. To the producers at Court TV that are watching this stream, thank you. You are the best. We stand and we will shout you out by name when we know. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for changing it back. <clears throat> so I am very interested to see how they tie those photos together. And then they're going to bring other people from this movie set that say that she was sloppy and reckless. And if she was sloppy and reckless in the fact that there were live rounds in those bandoliers 12 days before this, it wasn't just sloppy and reckless that day. It wasn't just negligent that day. It wasn't just Dave Hall's that day, you know? So I think the evidence they have and the evidence they're laying out is going to be powerful. I'm very interested to see what the defense says. So very interested to see what the defense says. I'm going to get to the rest of the questions. Hello, Kitty said someone at court TV. Is one. I, there's times I feel that way. I don't know if they actually are or not, but there's times when I'm just like, God, I really wish we'd switch the other camera angle and it switches. Either we're all thinking on the same wavelength or someone um, finds my commentary fascinating, in which case I appreciate you. Thank you. I'm curious how they plan to prove the drugs. Just a single witness testimony. Emma Mac, I'm curious too. I'm curious too, because what they've said is they handled a, uh, they, they handed her a baggie and they suspect it to be cocaine and she disposed of it. So nobody tested it. How, and then Hannah's saying, I need stuff. How are they going to prove it? How are they going to prove it? I don't know. I don't know. Um, Brittany said, as a neurotypical New Mexican, I appreciate his delivery. It's slow. When people talk fast, it's harder for me to follow and understand. Many here also talk with a slower cadence. Brittany, I appreciate your comment because you reminded us about the regional quirks that are appropriate. And we have seen this in every case. There are things that are going to play well for the jury that might not play well for me. He speaks slower than my speed of ADHD. However, it doesn't matter if it's too slow for me because I get to sit here and give commentary to y'all. If this is what the jurors are expecting, if this is what in the jurors' mind when they think of lawyer, he really is kind of like, let's just talk it through. That's all that matters, right? It, me sitting here doesn't, doesn't matter. That matters. All right, let's get to your Q and A's. Let's get to your uh, super chats. Let's get to a ton of you of gifted memberships. Thank you. Lori said, please bring Runkle on for a live if available. I don't do guests while I'm doing court coverage, but if there's time when Runkle can come on and we can talk about the weapons, uh, we absolutely, absolutely will. Question, if, they're, if they were in costuming, where was it sourced? I hope we find out. But what they're saying is the bullets that came from the prop house that morning, and remember, Hannah Gutierrez sued Seth Kinney and that lawsuit resolved. But if the bullets came from the prop house the day of the shooting, which is, is what we've seen in court filings, but they have photos of those live rounds 12 days prior, where did that box come from? And he did talk about these kind of commingling with the other bullets. But what we know from one of the civil suits is there were more than six live rounds discovered on set. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Uh, Stringed Assassin, Stringed Assassin said, if they already know this, then why are they charging Baldwin? Because Baldwin pulled the trigger. Like if Hannah Gutierrez Reed had been negligent all day long and negligent in loading the gun and negligent in getting the bullets on set and reckless, no one would have been hurt if a gun hadn't been pointed directly at a human and the hammer pulled back and the trigger pulled, there would be no involuntary manslaughter because no one would have died. So it's, um, it, Hannah is negligent and reckless and they are going to argue that the handling of the weapon by Alec Baldwin is negligent and reckless. I also think Dave Halls is in that and I don't know if I'm going to change my mind on that because I also think Dave Halls is in that. Hannah Gutierrez Reed's stepfather, Theo Reed, is on the witness list. So we're going to see. So that's why that's why they're bringing in Baldwin. And in Baldwin's police interview, and I broke this down on the podcast, God, over a year ago, in his police interview, he's like, 
he he mansplained weapons to the two female law enforcement officers. And I don't know if they chose to have two female detectives interview him or not, but it was a solid play because he wanted to explain to them everything he knew about weapons. And he was like, I'm a weapons expert, blah, 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 blah. I know everything, this kind of bullet, that kind of bullet. If he had sat down and was like, I don't really pay attention to guns on set. I don't really use guns. I trust the armor. I trust the first AD. And when they hand me something, I trust that it's safe because that's their jobs. It would have been completely different. Instead, his whole his whole thing is, I know everything about guns and I never pulled the trigger. Well, the forensics, um, the forensics go against what Baldwin is saying. So it'll be interesting. Question. Wait, I saw this one. Tori said it was a lot. It was a lot. And that's on uh, the Emily Show podcast. Question. If she gets convicted, how long can she serve? And can she also be charged for murder? Thank you. Ella, no, she cannot be charged with murder. There is no intent to kill here. The legal word of the day. I'm going to need a stinger for that. The mens rea is missing. There's no evidence to show that she intended for a death to happen. She was reckless in a way that when something goes wrong, a death can happen. Not all jurisdictions even have involuntary manslaughter. It is not the most, uh, it's not always well received the involuntary manslaughter charge, because if this is really just an accident, then is it more appropriately resolved in the civil sphere, not in the criminal sphere? Is it really a criminal charge if it is accidental? Involuntary manslaughter means there is no intent to kill, but you are reckless in doing something and reckless in a way where it can cause death and you should have known. I think the reason this is charged is because there are so many safety protocols on set that were not followed. That OSHA report is um, staggering in how much it slammed the lackadaisical nature on set and how unsafe this set was. The camera crew walked off that morning because it was unsafe. They had had previous um, accidental fires with the weapons before this happened. It was not a safe set. So the fact that um, she was in a position where if she had checked the bullets, this never would have happened. She is being charged with that involuntary manslaughter. No, she cannot be charged with murder. There is no evidence to support a murder charge. There is, this is not an easy charge for the prosecution. Um, but I think in all of the involuntary manslaughter cases I have seen, I think that the reason they brought this is because they have those photos to show she was reckless. Um, for the entire filming of the movie. So let's see. Um, don't sets have safety coordinators. Joe Jersey, yes, the safety coordinator on this set was Dave Halls, and it seemed that he did fuck all to keep this set safe. CEG, my episode on the OSHA report that slams him because he wasn't holding the safety meetings even after there were uh, fires of the gun. Somebody asked about, does DUI count as involuntary manslaughter? Anita, that is a very specific question and it really depends on the jurisdiction in some jurisdictions uh getting drunk when you have been advised that drunk driving can kill is charged as a homicide not an invol but it depends on the case law of the jurisdiction and that is probably a more complex question than you know but some cases um like in California, it's a Watts, Watson is the case, but you can show that if people know that drinking and driving is dangerous and can kill, they can actually be charged with homicide, not just an invol. So uh, let's continue on with questions. So somebody asked, uh, let's see, possibly similar to gross negligence manslaughter in the UK. Yeah, I know the UK does not have an involuntary manslaughter case it uh, or an man involuntary manslaughter charge but this could fall under like a gross negligence uh charge so they've gone back to the exit sign uh let's see california doesn't prosecute for murder rebel's best friend i mean i did when i was a prosecutor um so it it really just depends but again i left i left the office in 2017 and now i just get to talk to y'all about it on the internet um, there are over 16,000 of you here live. I'm going to remind you if you like live trial coverage and you want to stay in the loop over the next three weeks, when we're starting, what we're doing, what's happening. We built an app for that. It's free for you. iOS and Android, lawnerdapp.com. Also, if you are members on the channel, that merch drop is happening for 
our top tier members now. It's not going to sell out for our top tier members. It will sell out for our members tomorrow. So the merch drop that is coming tomorrow at 11 a.m. for members, we will also remind you in the app. So that is for the black on black uh, tumblers that are custom, custom etched. So that's happening tomorrow. If you're a member, you will see that in your member spaces at 11 a.m. tomorrow. There will be a link for you. Y'all think this guy was a sleeper? Wait until you meet Counselor Comatose. <laughs> they have approached. We'll see why they're approaching. Emily, would the defense have been better uh, served asking for a bench trial in this? They didn't have. They didn't have the option to do that. The prosecution asked for a jury trial, so bench trial was not an option here. He is talking to New Mexicans. They tend to. They don't tend to talk fast, and sometimes prefer a slower argument. Just saying. And um, Reet, it is a. It is always a perfect reminder, especially those of you that live in the jurisdictions, to remind me of the regional differences. I realize I talk fast even for Californians, and um, it is partly because I am neurodivergent. So that's not always appropriate. This is why you always need a local attorney for local cases. Alec Baldwin will not be well served bringing in New York and LA lawyers into New Mexico. They're gonna be like, New York City, ugh. Regional attorneys are incredibly powerful. You need someone who knows the area and knows the jury pool. This was even difficult in Los Angeles County because LA is really big. Pomona is different than Antelope Valley, different than Long Beach, different than the beach cities, different than Beverly Hills because it's such a fucking large county. Melanie, question for Miss Emily. Do you think that the fact that the movie was being made with such a small budget has anything to do with the lack of safety? Probably, but it shouldn't. Um, you don't cut corners on safety, and I don't think anyone's going to say it's okay. Whose fingerprints are on the bullets? Tina, we don't know yet. We don't know yet. You need to see vids of Keanu train for John Wick. I, I will watch vids of Keanu doing anything. Okay, so one of my friends from El Segundo um, was a costumer in the movie industry for a long time and worked with Keanu on movies, and every time I would be like, I need you to tell me more about Keanu Reeves. She's like, he's as delightful as you think he is. He's delightful on set. He's delightful to everyone on set. He's patient. He's professional. He's just a delightful human being. That is not what she had to say um, about everyone. Gab said, as a producer, I'm absolutely shocked at the negligence by so many people on this set that led to this tragedy. Same. Same. And it's. I think it's why I'm so outraged that the first AD pled for a six-month probation misdemeanor because he's the safety coordinator. Like, there, there were three people who could have stopped this from happening. Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, if she hadn't loaded the bullet. The safety coordinator, if he had done his fucking job. And Alec Baldwin, if he hadn't pulled the trigger while pointing a gun at almost point blank range to the cinematographer. There were three people that could have stopped this from happening. And we are now dealing with all of them being prosecuted except for Dave, Hall, Dave Halls, who are they just like, take a plea and go away. Runkle said, I've met the guys who trained Keanu. Well, Runkle, you're famous. The Supernatural Boys asked for armor training too. If I remember correctly, they check their own weapons before a scene too. And a lot of actors do. No one from Supernatural. Jensen Ankles is not on this uh, witness list. And I am gutted by that fact. But we can all still hold out hope. Maybe if we, um, maybe if we all collectively put it out into the universe, Jensen Eccles will testify. He he was on the set of this movie. I mean, he's not. He's. It could happen. <laughs> Emily said, "Emily is a fellow neurodivergent in Manhattanite. I feel you. The rate of speech is like molasses to me. To me, you sound like an average person here. Yes, and I realize I speak rapidly. Many a court reporter have told me to slow the fuck down." There was one court reporter that I worked with who, when I was giving an opening or a closing, would look at me and be like, <clears throat> Miss Baker. And I was like, oh yeah, sorry, right. Okay. I'm speaking beyond the rate of your typing. Um, shouldn't Baldwin also be liable as a supervisor? They are prosecuting him both as an actor and a producer, so they're going to talk about the duties he had as both. Yes, we'll get there. Alec pulled the trigger and he is a producer on the film. He potentially has all kinds of responsibility here. He's also, Dr. Bull Butter, he's also being sued up one side and down the other civilly. Hannah is not being sued civilly nearly as much. I do like her courtroom attire though. I feel that it's very professional and respectful. And it's gotta be hard to sit there while somebody talks about how much you're shit at your job 
um, with a with a neutral face, and I think she's doing a very good job as the defense uh, as the defendant on that. Chibi said, "Film and TV prop costume worker for blocking. We use wood blocks or sponges, and even then, you treat the sponges or block like a real gun. And this is what the experts are going to say, Chibi, when they come in. They're going to talk about this. For all of you that are in the industry, I appreciate your feedback so much." please continue to share with the chat. And we've got Runkle in here who is a weapons expert. Thank you for sharing with the chat. And we will we will make sure we find time to get Runkle in. Oh. I still have an LA cadence to speech. I, I know. And I call all of the highways near me the defense opening hey, statement. Let go. Counsel. I Ladies liked this guy. Jury, we are privileged, our team, to represent Hannah Gutierrez Reed. You're sitting Thanks, over Miguelina. here and we're here because of a tragedy. There's no doubt there was a tragic uh, occurrence on that movie set. But let me tell you something you already know. Just because there was a tragedy like this, dude. does not mean that it's a crime fault. was committed. It does not mean that Hannah Gutierrez Reed caused the crimes they have charged her with. And we are going to, through the course of this case, show you that production and the state very, uh, have both very early on sought to make Hannah Gutierrez Reed a scapegoat. That's what this is about. You're going to hear that this tragedy, several unconnected events, independent events had to happen to create it. That's true. First, I agree with you. The first event that had to happen is the actor Alec Baldwin pointed a gun on that set. And he either had his finger on the trigger and the hammer cocked, or he pulled the trigger as he was pointing that at Miss Hutchins and Mr. Souza, who was right behind her. And make no mistake, this is not a prop gun. This is a real gun. Mr. Baldwin pointed it right at him, either had his finger on the trigger and depressed or pulled it, causing that gun to fire and hit Miss Hutchins. That's the first thing that had to happen. Miss Gutierrez Reed, you're not going to hear anything there about had to her be a bullet in the gun, though. being in that church or firing that weapon. That was Alec Baldwin. It's so it's so much easier. You will when hear that Hollywood actors are not allowed to point guns, real guns, at other actors or crew. You're going to hear a lot. It's, a, of it's like every other it. uh, safety with guns in any other place in society. Treat them like they're loaded. You learn these rules uh, and go into the classes. You learn these rules if you've ever owned a gun. Rule number one, never point a firearm at somebody unless you intend to shoot them. And that rule was broken. And that's going to be the first thing you're going to hear that that caused this tragic accident. I like that he went straight to the, the second thing argument. is Absolutely. that Hannah is being made a scapegoat for are deliberate errors and mistakes by production. So the opening counsel for the state talked about Miss Gutierrez Reed and tried to put all of the onus on her. At the time, she was 24 years old. She had been hired for two duties, a props assistant, and you're gonna hear what that is, and the armorer role, two different duties. So they were splitting her between those and making her, for example, roll cowboy cigarettes. That was one of them for the movie, and they had props that the actors have. And so she was having to do that to take away from her armor duties. You're going to hear about that. And there are text messages now, of her saying, OSHA I don't have enough armor time. Oh, is a New Mexico time. agency. Oh. And that New Mexico agency is there an objection? inspected the movie Ooh, and investigated that's teetering the on shooting what the judge ruled after out. the shooting. You're going to hear that OSHA close. found fault with production. Well, you're close. They found numerous faults, numerous mistakes on production's part, not Miss Gutierrez Reed on it's production. Coming in with the expert. You're but... going to hear that OSHA indicated that there was a rush set, that there were several safety errors. And I'm gonna talk about those in a moment, but I want to make that very clear. When the state talks about Miss Gutierrez Reed being negligent, what really happened is production was negligent. Production put her in that position. They put her in the position of having two jobs, a props assistant and an armor, and expected a 24 year old under really tough conditions to keep up with everything that was going on. And you're going to hear about that. You're going to hear that Miss Gutierrez Reed emailed the production manager, Gabrielle Pickle, who's Which on I the think set. Is you're going to really hear Gabrielle important. Pickle. 
and she asked her for more armor days. She said in this email, when I'm not able to focus on my armor duties, this is when mistakes happen. And she was, she was telling her this. Now, Miss Pickle came back and said, no, we only have eight armor days and that's all you're gonna get. Eight days to so do your job. Out of the whole course in the movie, they didn't allow her to be an armor and to perform those duties that's to the extent huge issue. that she had to. And that's gonna be a very important point too. They, they moved her between two different things. Props assistant and armor. Yeah, this is really Counsel factual. Counsel for the state in his opening said that Miss Gutierrez Reed had the job of sourcing the ammo and sourcing the firearms. Apparently, she was also set. rolling cigarettes. Now you're going to hear when you go through this about another name, and her name is Sarah Zachary. She's on Sarah the Zachary list. was the props head. So, as the head of props department, she was Miss Gutierrez Reed's boss. In that role, Sarah Zachary had to source the ammunition and had to source the firearms. So that was not correct. What, what counsel stated in, in the opening. In reality, that was Sarah Zachary's job. Now you're gonna hear that what happened is those two worked together in conjunction. Hannah was, uh, Ms. So Reed fighting. was supposed to be doing armor. And then she was supposed to run over and help Sarah Zachary whenever she wanted the help on props. I'll put up a poll so at the end a lot of what you're going to hear who, who's is a resonated with you more created by production and forcing somebody to do these two different roles. You're going to hear witnesses in this case, including professional armor that the state has hired and other people that will tell you is completely inadvisable and a terrible decision on a movie like this with so many guns that you have a part time armor. It just is not a good idea. And that's a, a terrible idea, but that's what they did. Now, as counsel stated, Sarah you, Zachary you has will not hear been that the scene in the She's church a was a blocking. It was a getting ready for a rehearsal. So you're going to hear that Miss um, Gutierrez Reed had brought the gun to Mr. Halls, that Mr. Halls uh, never should have handled that weapon. And you're going to see he had a lot of experience in movie. He had the weapon. He did not. Uh, inspect that fully and you're going to see that mr baldwin didn't inspect it at all so he did not when counsel showed you that video accurate. on the first part of it when he's sitting in that pew and doing that cross draw you're going to hear about that i'm glad he didn't say pew, you're going to pew. hear how dangerous a seated cross draw is it's one of the more dangerous draws you can do because you're pulling the weapon across your body and you can also pull it across other people so you're so going to hear that Ms. Gutierrez Reed specifically requested other than a nerd round. to train Mr. Baldwin in a cross draw. You're also going to hear that he did not do that training. He did not set that training up. So when this tragic the shooting defense occurred, here is going with some other was dude, in did the it? very motion of a cross draw. And that's their you're best also going defense. to hear that this scene, this blocking, didn't even recall, didn't even require him to draw that weapon. Or have a weapon. So it's just going to be an extreme close-up scene of his hand pulling out of his holster, and they were going to focus on that, create tension in the scene in the movie. Uh, instead, for whatever reason, Mr. Baldwin pulled it out, and it ends up being pointed right at Miss Hutchins, the camera, uh, and Mr. Souza. You're also going to hear. We're going to talk about in the course of this case. There's Hollywood tricks. These guns should never be pointed at another person. That instead what should happen is there's camera tricks that you can use to make it look like it's pointed, but it's not. There's also things we're gonna talk about that, that Mr. Baldwin did at that moment that he violated and safety rules. Our gun and ammunition expert, Mr. Kuski, who you're gonna hear from, is gonna discuss safe gun handling and usage and go through safety I bulletins. like the glasses too. These safety bulletins apply on the set to movie actors and he's going to talk about that second let me talk about the live rounds now the government has a the state has a relatively new theory which is based totally on pictures and you saw some of those pictures what do you mean new and it's they also don't know based what's new. on they don't know what's the a new idea theory. that live rounds have a silver primer on this set so yeah. that's going to be the core of their argument and their theory yeah. And you saw in the picture, one of them had a silver primer. And the primer is just that circle in the middle of the round 
on the back where the hammer hits and that's what caused the round to fire. Now, what, what you didn't hear in State's opening was that there's gonna be numerous dummy rounds that also have silver primers. What? That were on this set. Sir, what? There was a FBI report you're gonna see that a box removed from the prop truck had 16 silver primer dummies and one silver primer suspected live round. That's new information. So this was a box found in the prop truck. Oh man, so that's going to be a the theory mess. that all the silver primer rounds are live is not correct. It's just not true. So you're going to hear during the course of this evidence because of these silver primer dummies, that theory does not work. Second, you're well, going to hear shit. that Russ Production ordered all the dummies on set. Russ Production sourced these primarily from a man named Seth Kinney. He's going to testify. Seth Kinney owned PDQ Props. PDQ Props was the primary supplier to the rest set. Now, you're going to hear that, that after the shooting, Seth Kinney was extremely active in contacting the sheriffs and trying to work with them to not get prosecuted to point the finger away from himself and you're going to hear about that yes he did you're Agreed. also going to hear that sarah zachary who i told you about earlier after the shooting she sent a text to seth kenny and it said emergency now sarah zachary works for seth kenny and pdq props she worked on set but she was under him she sent a text to seth kenny saying emergency you're then going to hear that they had a phone call very shortly after. This is just minutes after the shooting. Sarah and Seth are talking on the phone. How do we know? Now, we don't have that actual phone call, but whatever was said, here's what happened very the very next thing. I love Sarah this. Zachary goes over and removes rounds from two of the weapons, two of the actors' guns, and she throws them away. She did what now? Now... She did That's what now? Absolute and complete scene tampering. And when she first was interviewed by the sheriff, Sarah Zachary said, I was panicked. And that's all I can tell you. Why didn't she get charged? Now, I expect in the course of this case, you're going to hear that when she was interviewed, oh, she's going to say something like, I threw them away because that's what we do after scenes. No, it's not. And you're going to get to evaluate her credibility and determine why would these be thrown away they're, if they're dummy rounds, they're rounds that can be reused. They cost money. It doesn't make sense. You would just throw them away. And what was the real reason Sarah Zachary threw those rounds away right after her call with Seth Kenny? Now, you're also going to hear that right after the shooting, Sarah Zachary went over and she wow. shook some rounds and determined that they didn't shake, meaning she felt like they were live rounds. So then she throws these away. Now they're thrown in trash. She tells law enforcement, but they, on that day, they don't find them. Uh, but they're on a, they, she threw them in trash right by the prop truck, you're gonna hear, but they didn't find them. So we don't have those rounds. And you're not gonna be able to hear this in the course of this case or see them, see what Sarah Zachary threw away. You're not gonna be able to have that because they were never recovered. That's scene tampering. Yeah. You're also going to hear another instance of scene tampering. Sure um, would like to know why she wasn't charged. Sir, Sarah Zachary I, I, I carried got questions. items from the prop cart. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that prop cart. Right after the shooting, she carried items to the prop truck. So she moved items from the cart, knowing there had been a shooting, knowing law enforcement's going to be here, to the prop truck. So the other problem with the state's theory now and showing you that picture of those boxes and Benavita's truck and how they were kept on the seat is that we don't know what was taken from the cart completely. What we do know is that one box, Seth Kinney's box, appeared and was found in the prop truck. And we know that Sarah Zachary transported items from the prop cart to the prop truck. We know that, but we're never going to know exactly what was on that cart 
at the time of the shooting because it was because Sarah Zachary moved it. We're also not going to know because you're going to see on, on Officer Benavides lapel video. Yeah, I got a lot of questions right from law enforcement. Shooting, Ms. Gutierrez Reed was taken into his vehicle and segregated. She was segregated from all the other witnesses. She's sitting in his vehicle. Uh, uh, Officer Benavides feels, Deputy Benavides feels like he has to stay with Ms. Gutierrez Reed because she's distraught. So he tells another person to go get the prop cart. The prop cart is over by the church. He tells somebody else to walk over and get it. Now, I think he's going to acknowledge that he should have gone, gone and got that prop cart. Problem with that is this is just a random, uh, this is not a law enforcement, not random, we know who it is, but this is law enforcement's job to secure the scene. After a shooting like this, you don't want evidence to go walking away. You don't want it to go missing. You don't want it because we're here on a reasonable doubt standard. That standard is the highest standard under our crim beyond, under our law. Beyond a reasonable doubt. That means you can't convict somebody if in you this have a country, reasonable doubt. No matter who they are. Smart. Unless you prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. And what we've got here is theories based on evidence that has already been tampered with. And you're going to hear that in this case. That's not even going to be questioned. So you're going to have to take the leap that whatever Sarah took to the prop trick, we don't know. And whatever she did with those rounds, we don't know. And you may not know why. Yeah, but we're going to get to ask her. It occurred right after the call with Seth Kenny. Because she's testifying. And you're going to hear about that. You're what? going to hear about his contacts with, with a uh, witness named Del Reed. Del Reed is the father of Miss Gutierrez Reed. Oh, the cross-examination of Sarah is going to be in the amazing. history of movies. You're going to hear that he's been doing this for over 50 years. He's trained Brad Pitt, Sharon Stone, Denzel Washington. He did Tombstone. Some of you might have seen that. 310 to Yuma. He did 310 to Yuma. How did I he's know? He's a real deal. And you're going to hear that he trained Miss Gutierrez Reed. She was very well trained. She also went to film school. And she completed a bachelor's degree in that. So you're going to see that she was trained, she was educated, and she was ready for this job. Now, it was her her second job as head armor. You're going to hear that she had had one prior, and she had also worked as an assistant on another movie. But you're going to hear that from the time she was a little girl, her dad, Del Reed, had her on these movie sets, and he was training her. Now, Phil, the reason why I mention him is, is he and Seth Kinney right before Russ started, we're on another movie set called Yellowstone 1883. And that occurred in Texas. You're going to hear that Fell Reed brought live rounds. These were 45 Colt live rounds to Texas. And he and Seth Kinney were going to train the actors on a, on a range, not on the set, but on a range. So they sometimes train these actors to fire the weapon and see how the recoil is and kind of get a feel for it for the the, the movie so they can act it so he sense. brought these lab rounds they did the training they did yellowstone 83 and then seth kenny put kept yellowstone these on the bingo card in an ammo can he did not give them back to fell reed and again you're going to see these were 45 colt live rounds fast forward wasn't that much longer within months that we have rest set and Seth Kenny is the primary supplier of ammunition to the rest set. You're going to see evidence in this case that Seth Kenny's rounds in a box that the sheriffs found uh, were blue. They were a certain color. And, and we'll remind you, as, as we go through, we'll highlight that. But they were a certain color. And you're going to see, for example, on the picture that the state showed you in their opening, the live round they said that was in that gun belt. It's the same color. And you're going to be able to put that together as the evidence comes through. It's the same color as the rounds that Seth had. I love this judge's demeanor. I think the court reporter is up in the back next to the judge. You're also going to hear that, that the sheriff's investigation, they never took Seth Kenny's fingerprints. They never took his DNA. Huh. They didn't take his cell phone. So again, we're going to be missing evidence. Knowing that Seth Kenny was the primary ammunition supplier, knowing that he and Sarah Zachary had talked right after the shooting, 
Sarah had thrown rounds away. Sarah had moved stuff from the prop truck. None of Seth Kenny's phone, fingerprints, or DNA were taken. It's a good opening. And you're also going to hear that there was no request to the FBI to check those live rounds for fingerprints or DNA. Seth Kinney is the provider None. from PDQ Arm and Prop. So the FBI lab was He's on the witness requested list. to do a bunch of forensic tests. They were testing the, the firearm Mr. Baldwin used to see if it functioned correctly. You're going to hear about other tests they did, but no testing on the live rounds. Zero. Again, that's going to be evidence huh. that you are never going to see or have because the government they didn't, didn't do, it. do it. Good argument. And again, we have a reasonable doubt standard. Our expert, Mr. Kuski, is going to talk about the government's theory, state's theory, about these colors and, and the rounds. And I talked about that earlier briefly, but I'm just going to say it again because it's so important. The prosecutor could have gone after Cannot Sarah. They chose not a to. a live round from a dummy by a picture. And the reason for that is that the dummies are made in Hollywood to look just like live rounds. Now, that the point of that is the people watching the movie Baldwin don't will not know be a witness. That it's not, He's that, been that charged. Dummy. They're made to look just like a live round. Now, the picture counsel for the state showed earlier showed a, a hole in that round. That is how they make some of the dummies. It was a board hole. That's not how they make all the dummies. Some of the dummies, unfortunately, do not shake and they do not have a hole in them. And you're going to hear that one of those rounds was on this set. It's going to be in the CSI tech, uh, Miss, Miss Popple. It's in her report. Uh, it's called the Denix round from Spain. That round did not shake. So that's a dummy that looks like a live round and it does not shake with the BB, so you can tell. Mr. Kuski is gonna talk about how this is highly dangerous. He's saying the state and makes how it seem Mr. easy. Reed was but faced it's not. with a situation on this set of dealing with a mixed match of dummies, cheap dummies, he's gonna call it garbage, that were just thrown together that she had to deal with. Again, while OSHA is gonna tell you. She's being rushed. If they don't She's shake, having to perform two jobs. Out. She's asking for more resources and help from her manager. I've seen those she's emails. She's not getting it. There were multiple emails Third, where she said, I do not have enough time to do my job. You're going to hear that David Halls, the first assistant director, that he's going to say Ms. Gutierrez-Reed was doing a good job. Now, he's going to he wasn't. Did good with safety, I said. He was the first assistant director. He was the one that took the firearm and handed it to Baldwin. You're going to hear testimony that he never should have had that firearm. Never. He's going, You're going to, to testify. hear from the director, PJ Pesh, who's done movies for over 30 years. PJ Pesh uh, has done, all, you're going to hear about all his credits. He's worked on all kinds of movies. He's going to tell you that, that he's never seen a first assistant director in all those movies ever handle a weapon and hand it to the actor. This was a highly, highly unusual setup. Do you think this attorney wants to say this was a clusterfuck? Production. This was a clusterfuck was because production was cheap. And what they've tried to do, That's and what, what I'm you're seeing in this him. courtroom today, is trying to blame it all on Hannah. The 24-year-old, because why? Because she's an easy target. She's the least powerful person on that set. So what do we do? And you're going to see the evidence. It's a good opening. I they normally hate her. the some other dude did it defense, but it's it's going. You're to, also going to hear that David Hall to push into probable cause here. He did not address prior safety not probable issues. cause. Um, reasonable this doubt. This is part of the thing that OSHA found. He's David Hall report a lot. There were two accidental or negligent discharges on set, and what that is, they're going to have to talk about Sarah that. Sarah Zachary had one of them and a stunt double for Baldwin had another one. What those are, you have a firearm with a blank in it, and you don't either uh, decock it, it's called, where you put the hammer down I slowly can't. so it doesn't fire. If you, you don't say do decock right, it throughout this trial, I'm gonna lose my mind, sir. Uh, I am trying 
We've got the second one you're hear, and a stunt double had a misfire, and these were on the same day, five days before the shooting. Don, we'll talk about OSHA in a minute. The same day, within an hour apart. Ms. Gutierrez really addressed it by talking about them because these are safety incidents. You can't have misfires like this, uh, negligent you, discharges Ari. like this. People are walking around, they don't have air protection. These blanks can actually fire off stuff out of uh, smoke and everything that can, uh, it's dangerous. So David Halls did not do anything about David it. David Halls fucked Again, up. Again, that's his job. You're going to hear that he was the security coordinator for the entire set. Safety. But Safety. David Halls didn't delay. He didn't order additional training. You're going to hear some of the head people, if you hear from them in this trial, for Russ production, some of the head guys, they didn't even know about it. So they weren't informed about it. That's how much the production cared about safety. Because you know what the primary thing was here? It was rush, get this done so we can get the money. And that's all on production. And Mr. Baldwin is one of the primary producers. That's on them. Ms. Gutierrez Reed had no control over that. Finally, you're going to hear that. from OSHA that Rust Production didn't adhere to several safety rules that they have to adhere to He's on so set. That's why the they were fined. On the OSHA report. They gave them the largest fine in the history of New Mexico over this case because of what they did. Gonna come in. You're going to hear that they didn't have a procedure to ensure live rounds were not brought into set. Nor did they give Ms. Zachary or Ms. Gutierrez Reed enough time to thoroughly inventory. You're going to hear that Halls did not conduct daily safety meetings. That's true. And there was no safety instruction prior to Baldwin using the gun in the church. That's also true. You're going to hear that Russ failed to accord Ms. Gutierrez Reed more training days, and she was not able to train Baldwin on the cross draw. That's true. And you're going to hear again that Mr. Baldwin one of the lead producers, head actor in the movie, who really controlled the set, you're going to hear that he violated some of the most basic gun safety rules you can ever learn. From a young age, we all learn you don't point a gun at somebody ever. Agreed. But unless you want to shoot them. Multiple people can you be treat all guns as loaded, here. and you keep your finger out of the trigger until you're ready to shoot. He violated all of those. It wasn't Ms. Gutierrez Reed. That was Mr. Baldwin. These defendants having separate trials witnesses. is good for her because they can point them, at the empty chair at Baldwin, at the end and Baldwin's are, lawyers can't point. You're going back. to be missing critical evidence. It's very good for them that these are separate. You're going to not hear about Seth Kenny because the government didn't investigate him. They chose not to. Mr. Kenny, primary Provided animal supplier. The Talking with Sarah Zachary, she's throwing stuff away. They didn't go after him. They went after Miss Gutierrez Reed. And you can think about that. Why would they do that? Miss Gutierrez Reed did the best job she could under very, very tough circumstances. Which trying to get into this negligence. profession, a profession she really wanted to do. She was trained by her dad, a longtime armor. 24 years old. She had insufficient time to do her armor duties because she was also forced to do props. And management made a number of mistakes and did not create the proper atmosphere. Rust production in the state want to scapegoat her. She is not guilty of the crimes charged against her. And the, the prosecution must prove that beyond, beyond a reasonable doubt. Way. And I submit they will not in this trial for the reasons I've stated and the evidence that you will see. All right, thank you. As you requested said, by thank the, you at the end. council on directing any, any- I'm uh, putting up a poll. Uh, one that's going to be called as a witness in this case, including an expert witness as stipulated by the um, Chat, uh, council that none of these witnesses may be viewing this trial live stream on court TV. Uh, or with EDB. If you are a witness, peace out, come back later. <clears throat> and we're going right into the first witness, right into the first witness. 
I put up a poll. I'm going to turn this down while the first witness is coming in. I put up a poll. I found the defense opening statement to be much more persuasive because he was poking holes in what the prosecution said, which is absolutely what you need to do as the defense, the beyond a reasonable doubt. I often dislike the some other dude did it. This is not just a random some other dude did it defense. This is a look at the chain of power in this movie set. She is at the bottom. Have you advised um, Grace? Oh, oh, use that word. He oh, has, sure. he Thank brought you. in quite well, but, yeah. a lot of interesting information that is going to leave this jury questioning what's happening here. So when this jury is hearing the prosecution's evidence, they're going to be like, but what about Dave Halls? But what about this? But what about that? And as a defense attorney, that's absolutely what you want. And the prosecution has a long way to overcome of law it. That the testimony you'll give in this case First will be witness. the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. All right, have a seat, talk into the microphone. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? Good. Uh, would you please state your name for the record and spell your last name? Um, Officer Nicholas Lafleur, and the last name spelled L-E-F-L-E-U-R. Officer Lafleur, how are you currently employed? I'm currently employed in uh, the city of Santa Fe. Nicholas Lafleur. Um, going on two years. And, Lafleur and is, is a cartoon villain last name, sir. I'm a police officer. All right. Um, prior to uh, working at the Santa Fe uh, Police Department, uh, where were you employed? With the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Department. All right. And is that where you were employed on October 21st, 2021? Yes, sir. All right. Um, and on October 21st, 2021, were you called out to the Rust movie set? Yes, sir. Um, how did you receive that call? It came over the radio as I was um, in close proximity. Did you receive any information as part of that call? Um, that I like his glasses. Someone had been shot on a movie set. All right. And what did you do in response to that call? Yes, these are leading, uh, that, but they're background foundational, quickly, so quickly. nobody's going to object. And when you arrived, you're allowed to, the set, to lead were there a little. Any other uh, law enforcement personnel these are there? I was the foundational questions, there, setting place and time. A, a volunteer firefighter. There's no point to uh, fight with it. Unit in front of me. Okay. And when you when you arrived on the set, Linden. where did you arrive? Um, right in front of the. So the chat's going to want to know if you have a dog. Church they had set up as a prop piece. Okay. And on that day, were you wearing a, a lapel camera or a body worn camera? Yes, sir. Oh, this okay. is the camera they're not going to show. Um, Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to move for admission of State's Exhibit 1 that's been stipulated to by counsel. All right. Um, may I have permission to publish it to the jury? Yes. And do you do we want to do a reminder to cut the live stream? This is I that video. It. No, you're you not did. cutting the live, the live stream. No, we're not cutting the live stream. You're staying on the witness and not showing the video. You're not cutting the live stream. Let's not get fucking crazy. We're not cutting the live stream. They're just going to show the witness. They're not going to show the video. We're not going to have audio. We're going to answer questions. So um, I don't know why. I don't know why they're sealing the body worn camera video. I'm kind of annoyed that they cut the audio though interesting stuff all right we're gonna go to q a um while court has the audio cut for anybody who's new here there's over seventeen thousand of you could you do the likey subscribey things just i'm emily d baker i'm a lawyer been a lawyer over 17 years uh shifted career to doing all the you know legal commentary stuff you might have seen me on hulu netflix other places here on youtube my favorite place to be um, but my 12 year old does not believe I'm a real YouTuber yet. So I keep trying to prove that to him with vanity metrics. Let's continue on. Happy at heart said, this is not a convincing opening. That was during the time of the prosecution's opening statement. Totally, totally get it. Uh, walkie talkie said for the love, I'm super bored. Help the prosecution's delivery. And look, the defense delivery on the opening statement was still linear. It was not sensationalized. It was not dramatic. It was easy to follow, but it was more capped. The delivery was more captivating. Excuse me. The delivery of the defense attorney was more captivating. And instead of the defense attorney going through every little thing you're going to learn in this case, 
the defense attorney focused in like a freaking laser beam on what they believe the state and investigation did wrong and in the gaping board holes in the state's evidence. Hey, there was a conversation between the head of props and the prop house master on the phone, because we have the phone records, and then a bunch of evidence got thrown away and no one's being looked into about it. Ain't that some shit? Yeah, that is some shit. Yeah, that is some shit. I wanna know. I wanna know exactly what was thrown away by Sarah Zachary. I am very interested. And Hannah Gutierrez in her lawsuit against Seth Kinney uh, and Sarah Zachary alleged that they were sabotaging the set. That was her allegation in her civil suit that has since been dismissed. But there is, when there is shady stuff going on and when law enforcement doesn't investigate every avenue, I don't know how a jury sits down and says, but yeah, she did it beyond a reasonable doubt. He has done a great job in his opening of introducing doubt, questions that I'm gonna wanna see answered throughout this trial. And I, I think he did a fantastic name. Thanks for being amazing. Jessica, thank you for being amazing. Hope this trial changes the culture in Hollywood. Um, I don't know if this is a whole Hollywood problem, if this is a rust production problem, if this is a lower budget movie problem, but it's a problem. Sesame Street wasn't on my bingo card today. Me neither, but neither were board holes or decocking. But now decocking is most fucking definitely on the bingo card today. Carbon I Stardust said, why do I feel like the screaming goat is going to be a big figure in this case? Vincent's ready to go. Vincent's, this is how I feel about them cutting audio. Like Vincent's ready to go. Vincent's ready to go. As a fellow, a uh, fellow U.S. colleague of mine, didn't realize New Mexico is a state. <laughs> Brianna, no. It's like New Mexico. What? We, when we moved to Tennessee from Southern California, we um, we drove through New Mexico during uh, during the pandemic, and the the road signs were basically like, "Welcome to New Mexico. Please get out." It was so. It was like, just keep driving. Just keep driving through don't hotels in new mexico didn't want anyone to stay as we were driving through driving through new mexico was one of the most challenging states everything was shut down and they're like i don't care if you need to pee these bathrooms are closed it was it was it was it was special but new mexico's beautiful though the first time my husband went to new mexico he definitely got altitude sickness um so there there's a there's a lot of that question didn't baldwin rush the process and didn't allow proper safety measures that seems to be part of the defense argument here that Baldwin is the lead actor and producer was rushing things. I mean, Baldwin's not known for having the most um, charitable and patient disposition. Question is the district attorney involved in this case? The district attorney in New Mexico is still involved in this case, but the lead prosecutor is a special prosecutor in this case. Question, the lady next to Hannah is distracting, and now I am focused on her, who is she? The defense attorney said this is counsel, so it seems like she is one of the other defense attorneys. We have seen the male defense attorney that gave Mr. Bullion. We have seen him, because we have Bulls and Bullion on the defense team, but we have seen him um, on the hearings. I have not seen her on the hearings, but we have seen him on the previous hearings. He's the lead defense attorney. Peace and love, the defense is spitting facts right now. And you know what? It, when you keep an open mind with a case, we're gonna be like, oh, that's interesting. Oh, what about this? The case should be a little bit of a roller coaster. Like, I find that persuasive. I don't like that so much. It's just, we're not looking for facts to support any belief that we have. We are trying to connect the dots as the information is being told to us. And that's the point. Um, Carmen does stuff said, but what does this mean? I don't understand enough about guns, Emily. Carmen, the prosecution is arguing that it's obvious that there were live rounds on set and she was clearly negligent. The defense is arguing, no, no, some of those were dummies. You can't just say they were obviously live rounds. And, and the live rounds being on set, they're like, look, these are clearly live rounds. If that fact is not a fact, it's, it's going to hurt the prosecution. If the prosecution stood up an opening and said, look at these bandoliers with live rounds, and the defense has an expert saying some of those are dummy rounds, they're inert rounds, you can't just uh, 
you can't just say they're live rounds. It's going to absolutely hurt the prosecution. I'm interested in why so much ammo was in her hotel room. I feel it should stay on set. Kelly, I agree with you. We're going to hear a lot about it. Could Hannah sue for toxic workplace? Hannah dropped her lawsuit against Seth Kinney and Sarah Zachary, but I don't know if there's much more she could have done with that. Stone said, I have questions I want to know. I want to know too. I absolutely want to know too. Um, just catching up New Mexico seems lovely this time of year. Anna, it is. We're going to get like a short-term rental. I'm just going to make sure my volume's on so when the court feed cuts back to sound, we have it. Um, and we'll go from there. I think the defense opening was powerful. I agree. JK, thank you for the super chat. Welcome to our new members. Thank you to everyone that's gifting memberships. All I'm getting is that so many people should be in trouble. Aaron W. Yeah. Because the question we might be left with is, okay, but Hannah should have done these things. But what about Sarah Zachary? This, 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 that. What about all these other people? And that might be what we're left with. They have to determine whether Hannah Gutierrez Reed was essentially reckless and negligent and doing her duties or whether she was negligently handling a firearm. I don't think that's the theory a jury's going to go with. I broke that down in this week's episode of the podcast, the different theories of uh, involuntary manslaughter in New Mexico, but it's not easy to get there when it's like, okay, but her bosses were doing this and the OSHA report said this. And the OSHA report, just to clarify, because a number of you asked, I hope I starred some of those questions. Uh, let me see if I grabbed any. I don't think I did. But a number of you asked about the OSHA. Oh, here it is. Don Shute said, I thought the judge said no OSHA. The OSHA report's not in evidence, but the defense expert is allowed to rely on it. So the defense expert is going to talk about everybody else that fucked up. All right, we're back to volume in court. We're going to get back to this witness. I'm going to answer as much as I can. Vicki, is Hannah going to testify on her own behalf? I, I'm not going to hasten a guess until we see the prosecution's evidence. Because if the prosecution's evidence falls flat on cross-examination, she might not need to. Joe Ka, can, can the prosecution talk about who else they are charging? No. Charging her because she is powerless doesn't ring true while also charging Baldwin. Uh, they're not going to talk about it specifically. It's not relevant to this case. So basically, the dummy rounds are from Wish. Got it. <laughs> it's funny. Old Man Funky said, so... They are all guilty. Can we charge them all? They could have, but they didn't choose to charge Seth Kinney or Sarah Zachary. And they let Dave Halls plead video for six months of probation and a misdemeanor. The beginning. All right, we're back to court. I'm going to just take a swoop so we have the time. Yeah, I'm trying to get it out. Uh, stupid truck. Are we going to decide with the BBMs? This is... Uh, Can everybody hear it? Ma'am, sit down. We heard it. They... It's in the back of the room. You can't hear it. Okay. <laughs> Body cam footage is not always easy to sit through. This is body cam footage audio that we're getting from court. Sigh. What are you getting out of your truck? What's happening in that portion of the clip we just watched? Um, so I arrive, arrive on scene, um, go around to my passenger seat where I keep the uh, shooting trauma kit, hand it to what I leave was uh and that's why the video is sealed firefighters if the video is him and helping then, treat the victim that's why it's some trouble with everything that's locked because it was a new unit and everything uh, she wasn't used to pulling it out as fast and then i go retrieve a, a bbm kit it's a bag valve mask um for airway purposes can you help the, an individual get oxygen okay thank you Sorry, I'm going to do my best to deal with the audio, but the body cam audio is all just. This is law enforcement that showed up to the scene of the shooting first. Law enforcement does have some, um, some medical training. 
he grabbed the shooting kit. She doesn't want to look at whatever they're showing. What is probably, it is probably showing them rendering medical aid to the victim. And she does not want to look at it. I wouldn't either. But I think her face shows a lot of remorse. So they're arranging for the air flight. This is audio from body cam. For all of you talking about how young uh, this law enforcement officer looks, a lot of beat a lot of beat officers working in their cars are the newer officers. When you become more senior, you're a detective. You're not rolling out to scenes first like this. So it's it's um, it's it's typical, especially in smaller jurisdictions. It seems like he was first on scene, trying to render aid and trying to get the medical attention out there. For those of you saying it would be pretty traumatic for her to see that again, she might not have ever seen this. She might not have been in the area when this was happening. Generally, when law enforcement's working on someone who's been shot like this, people at the scene are not going to be right there on the scene. They're not going to see it the way they're seeing it now. Okay. What? Why are we playing back what just happened in court? Court IT. That was just a replay of his I know. previous. That was so life. fucking weird. That was not EDB. We didn't do it. That was strange. So um, she might not have ever seen this before, and she probably wouldn't have looked at this with her defense attorneys. They would have told her what is it, hit, but I don't know if they would have sat down and looked because this has. The video of the victim being treated really has nothing to do with her. Her action is before and after, the, but they have to establish that somebody died. Um, Please, and this um, is clearly very hard for her. Ryan, will you go get Grace? Grace! Grace is the on-site. Will you go get Grace? Just text her. Grace is the on-site director for Court TV. Uh, Judge Summers is not thrilled with, bench with, counsel. with that about the feedback that they were getting from Court TV. We're going to answer some questions at some point. We'll take a poll as to which celebrity this judge looks like because I've seen a variety of answers here. Grace! Sorry, as I channel my inner Bueller. Um, Grace! <laughs> She's not pleased. Not pleased at all. <clears throat> not pleased at all, but that has to be hard video to sit through and um, for everybody in the room. Hickers73 said, here in the UK, we don't get to see how our laws play out in front of a jury. Thank you, EDB and Court TV. I'm so glad Court TV has cameras in here and um, they're going to have to figure out what's going on with the audio. This judge, this judge is not a fuck around and find out type of judge. She's not going to let it slide. She's going to be like, fix it. Um, ammo in her room. Maybe she felt that the site was not secure enough and wanted to keep eyes on the ammo. LJ, we're only going to hear that if she testifies. Happy to be here gavel to gavel once again. Lexi, it's been a minute since we've done gavel to gavel like this. I mean, we did the defense part and the, um, the insanity defense on show business, but it's been a while since we've had a live trial that was, uh, a trial I was covering. If I were Sarah, I'd be real nervous speaking as a witness. Not going to be a good cross for her. Oh, oh, absolutely. The nice thing is Sarah Zachary and none of the witnesses should be watching opening statements. They shouldn't know the things that are being said about them. But the lawyers are going to know what was said and be able to say they're they are. You know they're going to come for you. Um, so she can she can talk about that. Uh, Joy said yes. The judge seems awake and open so far and likes to keep the momentum going. Yes. Um, don't be hating. I think I got that right. Uh, is she going to testify? I will not even speculate on that until we get further, uh, down into the prosecution's evidence because there's just there, that decision has probably not been made yet. So we got to see what's going on with, uh, the evidence. So we're going to wait. 
The poll that we do have going right now is whose opening statement was more persuasive for you. So you can go and vote on that pool. Shiraz said lots of culpables on set. The Murdaugh treatment, Halls, Zachary, Pickles, etc. Uh, let's see. Question. Army can have two duties, e.g. pilot and safety officer, but lose work hours limits except for medical and pilots. Would Hannah have had work hour limits or could she have worked late to check weapons bullets? She would have had work hour okay. limits. So um, and why she was you be back downstairs at uh, 1230? Is they're taking their lunch break. You all? Okay, so they're going uh, to lunch. Follow George's directions, but you know where to go on hour. the first floor and wait for George, okay? All Thank right. you. So please don't talk lunch. among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. Thank you very much. So court's taking a lunch break. We're gonna answer some questions. I will take a brief break. We're gonna break the we're gonna break the stream um and do an afternoon stream. I have found that the rewatch experience is much better for y'all on YouTube and it gives me a minute to uh, take a break. Now is a good time to remind you that if you are gonna take a break and grab some lunch, that lawnerdapp.com is going to remind you when we are back, let you know exactly when court is back so you don't have to worry about it. I'm gonna answer as many questions as I can and then I'm gonna take a quick break to get some food and do the rest of the things. Chelsea, Chelsea said Hannah failed to identify a live round and loaded it into a prop gun. She again failed to identify a live round in subsequent intentional redundant safety checks. For me, that's enough to convict. We'll see. I want to hear what you're saying. All right. Thank you. Uh, how do we jump from tragic accident to actual crime? Was Baldwin pointing the gun part of what they were filming, not at a person? Why was the gun real and have live ammunition? Is this level of legal action normal i don't know if we can ever say normal this is not outside the bounds of the involuntary manslaughter charge there shouldn't have been a live round on set ever but they do the prop guns are real guns and they do load them with dummies to simulate that um live when you are filming so that's not illegal to do but how did we get live at rounds on this set i don't know Emily said, I have to say as an HR professional and 20 something myself, being overwhelmed at work, needing a job for bills and having to possibly stand up to a much more experienced adult in power, that's rough. He's right on that. And I think the defense was right to, to poke at that, to remind the jury where they're at on all of this. They're right to, they're right, um, to do that. So we are on lunch mingling if you'll update the pin post i'm going to end the poll whose opening statement was more persuasive to you 82 percent of you said the defense 18 percent of you prosecution with over five thousand votes and we are going to lunch let's do a quick summary of the morning this morning in the hannah gutierrez read trial we heard opening statements from the prosecution and the defense attorney and the beginning of the first witness who was the first law enforcement officer on scene was rendering aid to the victim helena hutchins and joel souza and was arranging for the life flights that's what happened this morning in court the prosecution argued that uh, 12 days before the shooting you could see that there were live rounds on set loaded into other items loaded into other props and that hannah gutierrez was reckless on set she was negligent in doing her duty and that witnesses will come in and talk about the fact that ammo was everywhere that live rounds were in, in intermingling with the dummy rounds and that um she handed off what's presumed to be cocaine to a co-worker who she didn't even know that well and that's why there's an evidence tampering charge the defense opening statement, which many in the chat found to be more persuasive, argued that this set was a mess, that the superiors were not doing their job, that Rust Production purchased uh, really crap dummy rounds that look exactly like live rounds and they're not so easily distinguished. They can't be shaken. They don't have holes in them. And the primer at the back of the round looks exactly the same as the live bullets. And Hannah Gutierrez Reed was doing the best she could with the time she had, but that she didn't have enough time to do her job as armorer. And she was raising that red flag. They also said in their opening statement news that we have not heard before that shortly after the shooting on set, that the 
prop master Sarah Zachary was in conversation with the head of the prop house, Seth Kinney from PDQ Arm and Prop. Neither of these individuals have been charged, but Hannah Gutierrez Reed sued both of them in a suit that's since settled. And after that conversation, the defense is alleging that Sarah Zachary was taking bullets out of the weapons on the prop cart and moving boxes of ammo and throwing things away and that law enforcement never looked into it. I think the defense opening statement poked a lot of holes into what the prosecution had to say. And it will be very interesting to see this case. This is going to be a case where we might not know which way this jury is going to go until the very end because the defense experts are going to be very interesting to hear. That OSHA report came up a lot in the defense opening statement about the failures on set, the failures of production, and the fact that Russ Production was fined the largest fine ever in the state. Let's get to your question. All right. Um, let's see, we're going to go, we're going to go quickly to questions and then we're going to take a quick break for lunch because we've only got about 45 minutes. Hey, maybe we could do a study explanation of the state seals as we travel from state to state. Terry, that would be, uh, that would be lovely. I mean, here's what I like about this seal in this courtroom. First of all, let's do, let's do a quick, let's do a quick look at the seal of the great state of New Mexico. First, I love that it's kind of gold on loose site. You see the wall coming through, love the way it looks. Second, you seem to have an eagle and then another bird and the other bird has a snake in its mouth. Um, and then you've got the the arrows and the talons of the eagle. I'm here for it. There seem to be cactus or cacti at the bottom feet of the bird that's got the snake in its mouth. But um, that's all That's all I got. I, I like the way it's shown in court uh, very much. All the members, I love your members chats. Thank you, good to see you in Scotland. So thankful to spend an awful day with the best community. Thanks for making it bearable. Rachel, I hope the day gets better. We are here. There are, you know, 17,000 of your honored friends in the chat. Canical Heat said, no offense, Mr. Prosecutor, but you're talking and I'm hearing the teacher voice from the peanuts. Wah, 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 wah. Carbonized Stardust said, wow, man, that's just like when surgeons throw equipment in the trash after surgery. Scalpel in the trash? Not. I love that he's trying to convince us that negligence is normal. Well, sort of. Um, been here since your H3 appearance. Love trials with you. Time online. I love trials with y'all too. It's funny how many of you found me from um, chatting with Ethan about his lawsuit can we get a Nickelodeon people to liven this up with SpongeBob? We need like the Super Bowl, like Dora and the Ex the Explorer being like, OSHA is the Occupational Health and Safety Board. <laughs> oh my God. My 12 year old said to me the other day, something about green screen kids. And I was like, what are you watching on YouTube, sir? That they're, I, I worry that my 12 year old's like watching Moist Critical. I'm like, what? <laughs> What is that? Who is talking about green screen kids? He's like, no, you just put your video in the bottom and then you just like reshare it and you make money. I'm like, child, no, what we're not, what we're not going to do, what we're not going to do. Jeff or Jen, good to see you said this opening will resonate with any juror that has ever had a boss ignore or dismiss a legitimate concern. The defense attorney nailed it. This is a great observation. And how many of us have been there when you've said to your boss, no. I don't want to do that. And your boss is like, that's your job. That's your job. And I think it is, will absolutely resonate. I wonder how much of the texts and calls will come into play a lot with the baggie given to hold. I think a lot, but also I don't like, I don't like the charge of the tampering in the context that you have all of the allegations about Sarah Zachary throwing stuff in the trash and you're not prosecuting Sarah Zachary for throwing stuff in the trash, but you're going to prosecute Hannah Gutierrez Reed for handing a bag of something to somebody and that person threw it away and you never tested it. It's going to make the prosecution look desperate and like they're reaching. Gab said, I'm a producer. First AD at six months is insane. Motion for kinetic sand cutting on the screen. <laughs> in between court breaks, maybe. Uh, glad to be with y'all, honored. Glad to be with you too. The best thing for altitude sickness is ibuprofen, Tylenol, and drink a ton of water. Good to know now um heartless soul said my first live stream of court for all of you that it's your first time watching gavel to gavel coverage go ahead and pop a one in the chat 
Gringa said EDB is must see TV. I will absolutely take it. I will absolutely take it. EDB can be must see TV. Just if you want to put it on your TV. I know what a lot of you do is put the court coverage up on the TV so I can talk you through your day or on your work computer or whatever. And then you hop on your mobile devices to chitty chitty chat chat. I appreciate, I appreciate all of you. Thank you, medicated moment. You down with EDB. Yeah, you know me. Melanie said, thank you for the gavel to gavel coverage. My hubby is actually watching with me. Well, hello, Melanie and hubby. Uh, sidebar, black tumbler, not in store. I got the black, black sweatshirt. When does it release for the 3L tier? Uh, Tina KS Lawner, that text or that message came in at 1049. These went live for our top tier members at 11 a.m. Central. For our for the rest of our members, you will get your special private link at 11 a.m. tomorrow. Um, Matt Bond, good to see you. Hello, Spiffy Legal Jumbo. Spiffy Legal Mumbo Jumbo Talkie Sister from another Mr. Floofy says to tell the boys. She says, meow, meow. Don't forget to bloop the floof. Do your job no matter someone telling you not to. Hatsune, I would love to think um, that people would. I just can understand in a high pressure job, the fear and the worry. And then you you couple it with her dad being really well known in the industry. I'm interested to see what her coworkers had to say about her, but I don't know if she was in a position where she could have walked off the movie set. We'll talk about it, but when when the camera crew walked off, should she have walked off? Maybe. Would she have ever worked again? I don't know. I mean, maybe yes, because she's a Nepo baby. Maybe she would have. And maybe that maybe the prosecution leans into that and said, look, she could have walked off set. Her dad's really respected. She's really respected. People would have respected her. Um, but we'll see. I, I also think that Alec Baldwin can probably be real fucking scary. Perfect timing to listen to the fuckery afoot. Learn the law all while doing a deep clean of the room. Elise, good luck with your deep clean. Yorkie mom said, just ordered my black on black hoodie. Thanks, EDB. You're welcome. I love these. Told my boss I would be in court for the next three weeks. Marissa, um, I support that decision 100%. If anyone asks you what you're up to this week, just be like, I've got jury duty. Is Baldwin on the witness list? Brianna B77. I'm going to answer that question because it's a great question. No. Alec Baldwin has a Fifth Amendment right to not incriminate himself, and he is going to go to trial on this in June or July. He is a defendant. He cannot testify. He cannot be compelled to testify. They cannot make him testify. If he goes to trial, do I think he's going to testify on his own behalf? Oh, I think Alec Baldwin will absolutely try to charm this jury. I 100% think so. 100% think so. I know his lawyers are going to watch this really carefully and, and see what goes well and what doesn't go well. Cindy said, in my opinion, I believe she may have some blame, but I disagree with charging her. She was prevented from doing her job properly on set where safety was not number one. She was made to do two jobs, which is a bad idea. Cindy and the jury may agree. The jury may be like, there was no more she could do. Replay crew for two years, my first live. Laura, <laughs> welcome to the live. Isn't it fun? Uh, Candy mom said, did she bring muffins? Somebody better bring muffins in this trial. Zoe said, this feels like throwing a young a drug idol 20 year old under the bus, but I think is her having drugs on set says that she had to have to learn that from a leader on set. We'll see what comes out about that. Brandy said, excited for a new trial with you. I am too. Do we have a potential witness list? I do. I want to know if Jensen Enkels will testify, not on the witness list. He was at the scene when they were setting up. He would have been there when Hannah was. He's not on the list. Emily Merch Club with Stanley Tumblr mug. Um, maybe not, but we we do have some, we do have tumblers coming, and we have some more coming. Stina G, our our bingo card is growing. Decock is definitely on the bingo card. That's for sure. Uh, Alice, thank you for the compliments. I love this community. Is the black on black Lawnard sweatshirt uh, coming in a crew neck too? Uh, yes, we we will consider your motion for crew neck. We can put it up in a crew neck. We can. Dave said, why would they even allow a weapon that could fire live rounds on set? It's totally possible to build a replica gun and it looks like holding a real gun round that aren't. Dave, that would have been a choice made by production. So I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but that would have been a production choice. Let's see. Hi, just started following you after finding your deputy herd coverage. Happy to join live for the first time. Welcome. 
I, I know some of you are still finding me from Depp v. Heard coverage and from some of the stuff I've been doing in more traditional media. Question, why could the supervisor plea and not Hannah, the prosecution chose it, and I hate it. I hate that choice. I didn't make that choice. I don't like that choice. I don't like that choice. I think they got focused on trying to get Baldwin, personally. That's just my opinion. I think they focused on trying to get Baldwin and knew that that Dave Halls would help them get Baldwin. We'll see what Dave Halls has to say. When Dave Halls testifies, my face is going to be like this the whole time. All right, y'all. We are going to be back this afternoon um, in about 30 minutes from now. Mingalina, let's set the stream for one uh, one thirty-five uh, Central Time. And we will be back and this will chat. This will send you back over there. I'll leave the chat open if you guys still want to have a conversation. I find that the rewatch is much easier when we break these up. And I'm going to run to the restroom, grab a snack. I think y'all should grab a snack, grab some water. We will see you back here. Don't forget to download the Law Nerd app. Law Nerds, you're the best. I'll see you in a minute. You can stay up to date with everything I'm covering and fast notifications on our free iOS and Android app at lawnerdapp.com or search the app store for Lawnerd. You can also follow me around social media and don't forget to check out my podcast, The Emily Show, with quick bits dropping every Monday, summarizing everything I do here on the live streams on Tuesday and Thursday for when you just have time for the quick bits. Thanks for being a Lawnerd. Nerd.